Good evening, and now you're ready. Okay, thank you. Take three. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to our CAC meeting of April the 11th. And our meeting is being live streamed on Facebook Live. I would like to start this evening with a land acknowledgement. Kenful resides within the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge that our work is located within unceded and surrendered Mi'kmaq territory. Accountability to uphold in the process of truth and reconciliation. I further acknowledge that people of African descent have shared these lands for over 400 years in Nova Scotia and over 50 strong and resourceful African Nova Scotian communities exist today. On behalf of Kentville Town of Council, ten, excuse me, on behalf of Kentville Town Council, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our commitment to the struggle against systems of oppression that have resulted in profound inequities and the denial of self-determination rights. We are working actively to deepen our learning at an individual level, provide learning opportunities about anti-racism and decolonization to the sector, and to develop partnerships within organizations serving and led by underrepresented groups. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to um, extend a special welcome to uh, Ms. Wanda Matthews, our new Director of Finance. So welcome, Director Matthews. We're happy you're here this evening. So. so I will call the meeting to order. And um, I would like to note that the council will be voting electronically on all motions, except administrative, which will be by a show of hands. Are there any conflict of interest issues that council should be aware of before the meeting commences? And the chair notes that we have quorum. So we have been provided with a proposed agenda. CAO, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Thank you. Uh, just I have one deletion, which is item 6B number two. Uh, it was there as a, a bit of a placeholder, so that's going to be removed. So item 6B3 will now become 6B2. Does anybody um, have any other additions uh, to the agenda? Okay. Hearing none, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? Councillor Huntley? Councilor York, all in favor? Motion carried. Next, we have the Council Advisory Committee uh, minutes of March the 13th, 2023. If somebody could move the adoption of those, unless there are any amendments. Councilor Huntley? Second? Oh, sorry, Councilor York, all in favor? Motion carried. Great. So we will go right into uh, presentations. And first on the agenda, we have the Annapolis Valley Regional Library. Um, and the new executive director, Julia, will be presenting this evening. So welcome, Julia. And uh, we do have a time limit of uh, 10 minutes. Um, but we I'll let you use what you need to use. OK, thank you. And if you could speak right into the mic, that would Will be do. very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, that way. All right. Thank you very much for having me here this evening. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. My name is Julia Merritt. I am the new CEO at Annapolis Regional, uh, Valley Regional Library System. And I do have to say that I'm already finding a warm welcome and an excellent organization. So just a very quick introduction about me. Um, I've been working in libraries for 20 years in Ontario, starting as a page and assistant branch supervisor in the rural Wellington County Library System. I then worked as a branch supervisor at Pickering Public Library in the GTA, and then as interim CEO at North Perth Public Library, which is another rural and small town system. 
Um, most recently, I've spent the last nine years as CEO of the Stratford Public Library, where we made major transformations in the, growing the quality of the service and the ability of the library to support its community. I was also a long-term volunteer with the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries Board, which is an advocacy and lobbying organization, and the Perth Community Futures Development Corporation, a not-for-profit lending entity that supports local entrepreneurs. I have strong family ties to Nova Scotia, and I'm very much enjoying getting to know it better, and I'm, um, I am waiting for my chance to get back down to Pearls. So just a quick overview. Now let's see if we can go down here. Just a quick overview and update on library services in the Valley. I'm very happy to report that usage has rebounded and we are collecting our final statistics, but uh, the 2022-23 year should be above pre-pandemic usage levels. The new branches that have, are the new branches and the refurbished branches um, are thriving, and people are very much enjoying the opportunity to connect with each other in their communities in person. One example of these connections is the Moving Through project. This was originally a two-year grant and used the principles of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and the guiding themes of the Nova Scotia Culture Action Plan to incorporate uh, indigenous ways of knowing and doing to the development of programs, library spaces, and materials to build relationships between AVRL and the three area First Nations communities and to strengthen literacy connections for local Indigenous families. I'm very pleased to say that the Library Board has decided to continue funding the staff position associated with this project on a permanent basis to continue to work towards the goals of the original project. And looking forward to the immediate future, I'd like to highlight two important areas of focus for Council. First is that the regional libraries are beginning to work on um, developing an updated uh, brief for the province regarding the financial needs of Nova Scotia's public libraries with the goal of having a new funding formula in place for when the current formula expires at the end of uh, quarter one in 2025. AVRL will also be looking to draft a new strategic plan, taking the time to engage the community in consultation and then to work to refine its services to meet the evolving needs of the communities. One of the ways that we have done so most recently is with an initiative that we call Same Page, Oops. which is one of our biggest initiatives to date. It is a partnership between all eight regional libraries in Nova Scotia, so it does not include Halifax, uh, and it increases the size of the shared collection to over one million physical items plus all of the digital items. And for context, AVRL only owns about 130,000 physical items, so this has exponentially increased the depth and breadth of the collection and delivers a higher level of service to all across Nova Scotia while being increasingly efficient with our funding. So this project launched in April 2022, and again, we're, we're just collecting the final year-end statistics, but we are seeing a huge 44% increase in circulation year-to-date over that 21-22 period. So really, really excellent um, and successful project that is meeting the needs of, of what our residents need. So in conclusion, I would just like to say thank you very much for having me uh, and thank you very much to you as one of our funding partners and I look forward to looking, working with you all in the future and if you have any questions, I will do my very best 10 weeks in to answer them. <laughs> thank you very much, Julia. That was a great presentation. Does anybody around the council table have a, uh, any questions for Julia? Council York. Welcome to the Library Board. I am I sit on the Library Board as a council representative, so I'm really excited to welcome you in. And I know we haven't officially all sat down yet, but it's coming up in a couple of weeks. So welcome aboard. It's a lot going on and a lot of happening right here in our own library at Kempo. We're really excited to have you on board. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I think that's all we have. So Thank you, get you very off easy much. This time, so. Welcome again, and good luck in your new role. Thank you. Thank you, you know where to find me if you need me. Yes, thank you very much. Next on the agenda, we have Community Suppers, VCLA, and the presenter is Judy Lip.
Good evening, everyone. Okay, thank you. Is this working? No. Not. Was there a trick here, Jennifer? You said. Don't look quick. There we go. There you go. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Judy, and uh, I'm. Sometimes you see me out in the woods, in the gorge, and at the marsh, and used to be at the ravine. I take kids outside and families outside. I, I normally wear a, hat, a different hat with flying squirrel. Flying School Adventures, but um, this is another passion project of mine. Um, so I'm very excited to be here and present to you um, a collaborative initiative uh, that started exactly one year ago. In fact, I just came from this place called Kentville Community Suppers. Um, and I have a little bit of soup on my shirt uh, because I'm <laughs> serving carrot soup just before I walked out the door. Um, so, uh, but I wanted to share with you, this presentation really is, is uh, it's a bit of a story about this initiative. It's a story of the people that have come together to make uh, Community Suppers uh, this vibrant and amazing space that happens every week up at Oak Dean. And it is also an invitation. And it's an invitation to everybody here and on council, but also everybody in the community, everybody online. Uh, there is supper being served every week uh, at Oak Dean location of VCLA, so 118 Oak Dean Avenue. Uh, and it's a, a collaborative between myself with Flying Swirl Adventures and the Blomina Naturalist Society. Valley Community Learning Association is the host. Uh, Kids Action Program is uh, part of our group. Uh, Mentoring Plus and Y Reach, those would be sort of the main groups that came together in, well, actually we came together in the fall of 2020, is that right? 2021. Uh, and, and then we, we started our first, we had our first dinner in April uh, 2022. Yeah, years are just flying by. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, some folks in the kitchen cooking uh, actually a Korean meal. Um, Bo is in the foreground here. She's leading the, the meal and she brought her friend uh, and then we have a family, a mom and her five-year-old, and some folks in the background who I don't recognize right off the bat. Um, but uh, that's been one of the fun things is we've actually been serving a lot of delicious international cuisine. Um, but before I go there, I just want to say that Community Suppers is a place for everyone. So recognizing that food security is a central issue, um, that was certainly a motivation for us to come together and talk about how do we serve food for people who don't have uh, a meal, but also how do we serve food in a way that removes all stigma uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, accepting, accepting a free meal. And also how do we serve food that's super healthy, that's local, that's culturally appropriate, that's you know, made with a lot of love and intention. Uh, and that really is sort of the underpinning of Community Supper. So when we came together, we always had the intention that it would be for everyone. So there was, there was because there's no way to decide, well, you know, you, you need supper, you don't need supper. And also, I would say one of the things that was also a strong motivator is that a lot of people eat in isolation. Um, and, you know, even for myself, I'm a single parent and I feel like sometimes all I'm doing is just jumping up from the table and running over and, you know, so for me, even having a space to come and have a meal that somebody else has prepared, um, you know, is, is something to look forward to. Um, but we know that there's lots of seniors living in isolation. There's all kinds of single parents. There's a lot of young people going to Nova Scotia, the NSCC who are, you know, not, you know, a have financial uh, limitations, but also, yeah, aren't eating particularly well and aren't eating, you know, in a very social sort of context. Um, so that's, so that, so it's just something I want to emphasize um, because I think a lot of people have seen the signs around and I, I've definitely had conversations with people I know who've said, oh, community suppers. And I've said, you know, you can, you know, come along. It's every Tuesday. And they're like, oh, I didn't know it was for us, you know, and these are people who have means. Um, and I said, no, no, it's for everyone. Um, so, and what, what has happened as a result of that, um, and I'll just mention this menu, um, actually this one was, uh, this was our Canadian Chinese uh, <laughs> contribution <laughs> we, uh, pre presented a couple weeks ago by somebody who's a master chef. 
um, who comes to the kitchen and, and cooks a meal every once in a while. Um, so I've already mentioned it's much more than a food security program. Um, so what we've seen is lots of people just meet, meeting old friends, making new friends, eating uh, healthy locally sourced food. So tonight we had some fresh greens from Longspell Point Farm um, and uh, Oakview Farm, car carrots and, and greens, uh, some, some organic chicken. Um, what we're seeing is lots of families coming out with their kids. You know, a, a lady came, uh, and I'll show you her photo, but she started an art table for kids. Um, again, these are just spontaneous contributions. These are not things that we've asked people to do. They've just come, they've enjoyed the meal, and they've said, oh, I, you know, I don't want to cook in the kitchen, but I've got something else that I want to offer. Um, we're building connections, we're celebrating, like tonight was you know, a beautiful celebration of our one year anniversary, but we had a number of people there that are actually graduating from NSCC, so we had an opportunity to, as a community, celebrate um, that success of that milestone. And we're growing a community in a way that I think it really is reflective of the diversity that now resides um, in our region, uh, which I think, yeah, as you'll see from these photos as we go forward, um, but I'll start with some numbers. Um, so this is year one. Uh, we started, our, we were just reflecting on the fact when we, we had our first community supper, we had 25 people and most of them were volunteers who were part of the organizing <laughs> committee. Uh, and I, when I left tonight, there were probably 85 people uh, and that was early in the night. So I'm guessing by the end of the night tonight, we'll have sort of 90 to 100 people. Our average for the whole year was 72 people per week. Um, we've served food every single week, uh, except we had a we had a forced break actually over the holidays because the kitchen at VCLA was being renovated, uh, and we had one storm day, um, which is kind of remarkable. Uh, you can see here from the numbers we've we've we always make more meals than we serve, um, so we do also have um, either takeaway or people that are students at VCLA. So sorry, I'm using acronyms. That's the Valley Community Learning Association which is of course a school for adult learners. Um, so, and they have a meal program at lunchtime, but this supplements that. Um, the number of volunteers, I mean, we have at least five or six every night. Um, and my favorite number here is the 21 num is the number of cultures represented. So you can see all the different meals that we've already, um, that have been served. Um, We've even had a meal from Uzbekistan. Who, has, who here has had a meal from Uzbekistan? I don't even know if there's <laughs> such a restaurant anywhere in Nova Scotia, but we had a meal prepared by a chef who uh, came to Canada, and he's from Uzbekistan, so a pretty neat uh, experience. Um, speaking of other celebrations we've had, um, we've celebrated a couple of Hindi festivals. Um, we've celebrated Ukrainian National Heritage Day in August, we had 100 and people, 120 people come out for that. Um, and our biggest turnout was for um, Diwali, which is the Festival of Lights, the, the uh, Hindi festival. And we had 100 and I think it was like 100, almost 150 people. Um, so just I just want to share a little bit about some of the people that come to community suppers. Um, so the woman here on the uh, far left is Najez. She's from Iran, so she actually prepared a meal, a Persian meal, um, last spring. Uh, and she used to come with her daughter. Um, over The next lady here is Glenda, who turns out uh, was at our very first community <coughs> supper. She's a student at VCLA, and she's a Red Seal chef. And when she saw what she was, we were doing, she said, oh, I have run so many community suppers when I lived in Toronto, and she hasn't been out of the kitchen since, pretty much. <laughs> um, and Lucas was also a, he's a student at NSCC in Disability Studies. He was, he actually would come and arrange flowers for the tables to make the tables look nice uh, through the spring. Uh, ben is, fra is it also an NSCC? C student in disability studies, and he um, he's just graduated. And he's from Indonesia. He's actually about to go home for a visit after two years, and he's uh, been helping with the art table. Um, Xavier uh, is either eleven or twelve, and he loves to just share the news and the information in our opening circle. So every time we uh, before we serve our meal. We always have an opening circle, and we just 
you know, acknowledge the land, acknowledge the farmers, um, we acknowledge the, the, all the volunteers, and we have a few sort of routine things we have to talk about in terms of hygiene and, and then also recruiting people to help with cleanup and, and so on. So Xavier is always um, help, very helpful in, in piping up. Um, but in this particular picture, he's at the cleaning table, um, cleaning dishes. Uh, Marie is our dessert maker. So when we first started Community Cypress, we were making dessert, and then we soon realized that was just <laughs> way too many things. And Marie um, offered to make desserts. And so now we have desserts by contribution, and so every week we kind of have whatever shows up for dessert. Sometimes we don't have anything, but most, most weeks we have something. Uh, and tonight we have birthday cake. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is Efren. Um, he's uh, came to Canada about three, two and a half years. No, sorry, one and a half years ago. He's from Mexico, and he has been hosting our circles for us um, after a, a few weeks of initiation. Um, and he's brought in desserts, and he actually made a Mexican meal one time with his friends. Uh, and then we've got Yana and Oriel, who are um, newcomer youth. Um, Yana is third and Oriel's 18 and they actually come every week and help set up the community suppers. Uh, in the middle is our contribution box so we do have a place where people can leave um, contributions they can you know make a, make a financial contribution but we, we very much emphasize that just people being there is a contribution um, but also we ask for you know feedback or advice uh, we get a lot of uh, notes from kids saying pizza next time <laughs> So now we have to build a pizza oven. Um, oops, sorry. The next lady is Mary, and she's an art therapist, and she initiated the art table. Um, John is a retired professor, professor, and he does dishes every week. Um, yeah, and then I spoke a little bit about the cultures um, that we've. Yeah, we've had lots of uh, lots of meals from from other parts of the world, um, and we've also celebrated local local cuisine. Um, yeah, this was our, our, our called? oh yeah, the Holi Festival, also a Hindu festival of, of colors, a springtime festival. Uh, and then to conclude, yeah, I just want to mention that you're all welcome um, to join us. And it is every Tuesday at the uh, Valley Community Learning Association at uh, 11818 Avenue. Um, we are also putting in an application for, for funding. Um, so we, are, we would love your support financially if you're able. But if there's other ways to support too, you know, you've got lots of connections in terms of you know, food suppliers, kitchen, you know, you, we don't even really know um, what connections you have that may, may be relevant. But I think that's one of the really exciting pieces uh, or exciting outcomes of community suppers is the collaboration and the cross-pollination that has happened because people just keep coming and they keep talking and they keep sort of figuring out how else, you know, whether they're neighbors and they're figuring out they have things in common, but even as organizational leaders, we've started to come up with new initiatives or talked about different ways that we can work together. So, um, you know, financial support is always, obviously very helpful. We, we actually do have support from the province that's now paying for a uh, kitchen coordinator, which has been a big load off the volunteer, um, uh, the, the volunteer effort. Um, but like I said, there's, there's lots of other ways that uh, contributions can, can weave in to this, uh, to this beautiful space. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, would anybody like to ask a question of Judy? Councillor Maxwell. Thanks, fantastic what you're doing and a tremendous use of the space up in OD. Mm -hmm. um, just fantastic. So thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, yeah. And I should mention actually the gardens, which, you know, BCLA uses the gardens as a learning tool, but that food also, you know, shows up at the meal so yeah it's it's a beautiful kind of weaving together of many fine things yeah. oh you got me okay <laughs> thank you oh i i actually had a oh, question <laughs> that's okay <laughs> Be, but before i speak i always want to make sure that nobody else around around the council table wishes to okay um so thank you judy um 
What a jewel that we have right here in Kempfel. Um, I think it's wonderful the work that you're doing and uh, to, have, to have so many folks come from this community and surrounding communities and make everybody feel welcome. Uh, it, it reminds me a little bit of the KCA breakfast program in terms of it being all inclusive. So if there was, if there was one thing that, that you would like to see happen uh, or how the community can help you, what, what would that be? <laughs> I wasn't expecting a question like that. Um, well, I guess, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity to weave, you know, local businesses and other, other players and other, you know, groups that are active in, in the town, okay. you know, to become a part of what we're doing. So part of it is, you know, spreading the word. Okay. Part of it is maybe, you know, that deliberate matchmaking of like, oh, you really should talk to, you know, often those kind of, you know, sometimes we just, all of us need those little, those little handheld, like, you should talk, you know, I think you've got, you've got lots in common or whatever. So okay. I think because you're all so well connected, you can probably sometimes see those dots, you know, better than we can. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. So next on the agenda, sorry, <laughs> are the uh, department reports and recommendations. So all of council's been, re re, uh, the reports have been circulated and we've reviewed them. And uh, so CAO Choke, if you could present the reports or have the directors pre present the reports. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so tonight, uh, actually with our finance and min report, our new director of finance, Wanda Matthews, will come up and uh, do a quick run through for us. Okay, thank you. And I'm on. You can hear me? Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you, Director. Uh, so as uh, was noted, the uh, package has been circulated, but I wanted to draw your attention to uh, Schedule A and B. Um, that does include the actuals. Wanted to make sure Council was aware that those actuals at the end of March are prior to any year-end entries, so there will be other adjustments to those um, throughout the course of working through our year-end procedures. Uh, next, if we could just focus on the projections for a moment. Um, in those projections, you will see uh, a deficit is um, projected at this point of 64,800. Um, as, as I said, there are year-end entries and adjustments that need to be made. I did want to highlight, though, that there are uh, two items that have been expended that were not budgeted for initially but had been approved by council that are embedded within that. Uh, one would be uh, worth 50000 and that would be for the road work as well as 15000 for uh, a facility study. So those uh, really contribute to that 65000 now. Um, we do know as of today, we received uh, some revenue that hadn't been budgeted of over 50000 So hopefully that will help offset other year entries that may come in the other way. We are um, quite optimistically hopeful that we will come in in a balanced position without needing to um, make any adjustments through uh, reserve at this point in time. Our audit uh, is, work is underway by the finance team and our audit is scheduled within the next couple of months. So we will uh, be bringing forward that to a committee at that point in time. Our 23-24 operating budget is in development. And uh, in my first three weeks, <laughs> I have been uh, working uh, with my colleagues around uh, the uh, directors and leaders table to um, come up with our program budgets and we'll be bringing those forward to council at a future date, but it is progressing well, and I just wanna take the opportunity to thank people for the welcome and um, the uh, hitting the ground running with a lot of uh, high impact activities the first three weeks. <laughs> so happy to answer any questions if I can, if not, my colleagues may be able to do so. Okay, thank you, Director Matthews. Councilor Zabin, you have the floor. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, welcome, uh, Director Matthews. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, could you ask the CAO or the Director for me if um, with, the, um, with the increases in uh, property value and whatnot, do we know now how much extra um, revenue we're going to have from the, from the increases compared to last year? Do we have a number now, roughly? 
And, and that's okay, you can ask directly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, so uh, remember the revenue is capped. So uh, based on that, uh, total revenues are certainly up over a million. Uh, have, but I will also tell you that operating expenses are pretty much matching that. So we're actually in a process right now where we are, are trimming the expenditures to balance the budget. Um, and part of that is, you, you know, everybody is well aware that um, we operationally, things like fuel, the cost of the vehicles and everything have gone up dramatically. Um, so our intention obviously is to bring forward a balanced budget. Um, and essentially we have at this point in time four or five um, positions that will also be coming for council's consideration as well. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Maxwell. Oh, thank you, um, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering uh, a couple of things that uh, we're, we're quite large differentials here. Um, and, and CAO may want to weigh in on this. Um, the seasonal lighting, the budget was actually $8,000 and the actual is expected to be $19,526. Um, why, why such a difference between those two figures? Do we know? Probably the CAO. I think... Uh, Director Benningfield? Did, yeah. I believe that that was just coded to a different account. Oh, oh so it's, okay. Yep, thank you. It was out in the wash. Okay, <laughs> okay. And one other um, convention and travel was budgeted at 3,800, and the projected is 6,000. Um, do we know why we have that? I don't have it offhand, but I'm happy to send you an email during the week yeah. once I have a chance to uh, take a look into it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. If no one else has any questions, I just have one question, um, and it is with regards to other revenue and own sources, and it is uh, the line item interest and penalties, mm -hmm. and uh, it was budgeted for 92, and actually we generated 214,000. I think I can answer oh, that. Oh, wonderful. Uh, <laughs> if um, that is in our actual? Yes. Yeah. So the uh, prime rate went up almost triple yes. from the time that we created our estimate. So it is our actual revenue on our On prime. the interest. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. That's great. That's one positive for uh, the yes. prime rate going up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> great. Okay. Mm. Any other questions? Nope. Hearing none. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Matthews. Okay, so next on our agenda will be planning and development. So there's two components here. Uh, Kirsten uh, Duncan, our acting development officer, first is going to do the staff report, and then she's also going to be giving us an update with regards to the rezoning application. Thank you, Council. Um, tonight on our planning and development staff report, um, I'd like to just highlight a few um, key items. Uh, budget planning is ongoing and operational numbers intended for the 2023-2024 programs have been submitted to the finance department as Director Matthews has uh, alluded to. Planning has some exciting things under the horizon uh, under both the development and tourism umbrellas and staff are looking forward to a busy event and construction season. For development permits in the month of March, we issued nine um, with a total building valuation of 3,018,660. The activity and development report breakdown is attached to, my, or to our report. There was one new subdivision file that was submitted for approval this month. Uh, the Canada Cup Rider Recruitment web campaign has been launch, launched across Atlanta, Canada and aims to increase rider participation in the upcoming National Canadian Championship event this summer. A reminder that the event is not just for professional level riders, so local bike enthusiasts of all skill levels are encouraged to check it out and get the kids involved too. The planning department continues to field a high volume of inquiries from parties interested in relocating or opening new businesses in town. 
The department is currently assisting multiple groups with inquiries about available space, permit requirements, and other startup related items. Anyone with commercial space to fill is encouraged to contact the Community and Economic Development Coordinator and put their information on a list that is passed along to space seekers uh, through the planning office. Um, we're also hiring for summer VIC staff and that will be taking place over the next few weeks. Uh, job ads were posted earlier this week. The KBC Events Committee met for seasonal planning and are excited to roll out some expansions to existing events. Some modifications are also being made to create some more efficiencies around event management as well. Some upcoming events that we'd just like to highlight and put on your radar are the Apple Blossom Festival, of course, and the Black-owned business pop-up event that happens Apple Blossom Saturday in Center Square, and also Multicultural Festival. Um, our department report had stated that site plan approval amendments were being drafted for this month's uh, meeting. However, um, upon some advice that we've received, we have since pulled those back and are just waiting to uh, proceed um, and potentially at a future point. Um, the staff have compiled further information as requested by council at the March CAC for the McDougall Heights rezoning. The supplemental report will be next, um, that I'll cover. For the municipal floodline mapping project, we've received the final report and associated maps. Uh, we expect to uh, get a presentation from Dillon Consulting Limited uh, to review the findings uh, with the project stakeholders and staff will have an opportunity to ask some clarifying questions about the results of the study and get some more information. And some beautification plans uh, for spring are in place and are ready for installation over the next few weeks. Center Square activation will begin as soon as possible based on the staff availability and weather. So look out for that and I uh, hope you all enjoy it this summer. And that's gonna be my uh, report for the planning and, uh, sorry, planning and Development Department tonight. That's great. Thank you very much, Ms. Duncan. Does anybody have any questions for Ms. Duncan? Councilor York. Thank you. Uh, it's not in the uh, package, but I'm just, if you could remind me and perhaps confirm that Multicultural Festival has moved from the summer into the fall in September to incorporate NSCC students. I believe you're correct, okay. um, but I'm less confident to give you an exact date. Fair so enough. we will get back to you. I will follow that. up with you. It, Thank it you. is in September for sure, and it, it was to accommodate the, the students coming back. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Thank Deputy you. Mayor. Yeah. No worries. Any other questions? Okay, so we're moving into the next section, which is the rezoning application update. Maybe just before we start in yes, council's CAO, package. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Ms. Duncan has uh, supplied some additional information from the last opportunity we were together and, and had questions around rezoning application, but more importantly, I think um, she's going to do a walkthrough tonight of a number of things just to make sure visually um, council is, is comfortable with the information and are, have an opportunity to ask any questions. In addition, within your package, you're gonna see two pieces. One is there are a number of comments from an organization called C plus D Community Design. So Carolyn Robertson, who is a planner uh, and officer services on, on contract to a number of municipal units has had an opportunity to review the application and the work that's been done by Ms. Duncan. And so there's some comments there. Also, you're gonna see a letter from the Annapolis Valley Regional Center for Education. And so one of the pieces was around specifically with regards to schools. So we did get a letter of confirmation from um, the Annapolis Valley Regional Center. So um, I think uh, Kirsten is going to take us through a bit of an overview on a number of things tonight. And at the end, if there's any questions, please um, ask them and we'll, we'll do our best to, to answer them. So Kirsten. Thank you, CAO Truck. During March CAC, staff brought forward a report outlining an application received from Brighter Community, Community Planning and Consulting on behalf of Bryson Developments Limited to rezone a vacant parcel of land. After review of the report and presentation by CAO Dan Troke, Council had a number of outstanding questions and concerns surrounding the proposed development. The intention of my report in this presentation is to provide further information to Council around those questions and concerns. 
Um, as an addition to the staff reports that have been brought to council to date, as CAO Chark alluded, the town has engaged C&D Community Design to review the compiled information and provide a professional opinion on the proposed development from the standpoint of a licensed professional planner. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide a brief recap of the application. The subject property is a 43.2 acre parcel of land that is vacant and includes a portion of the Mitchell Brook water course on the west side of the property. This property is currently zoned R5, large lot residential, and its surrounding land uses consist of existing single unit dwellings, parkland, bulk vacant land designated for residential development, and the proposed arterial road. At this juncture, I'd like to take a moment to review the map that's on our screen. This is an excerpt from our generalized future land use map, which is a part of our municipal planning strategy. This map indicates the general land use designations for this property and the surrounding area, which has been approved by council. You can see the land is mainly designed for residential use as symbolized by the color orange, or I think it's still portraying as orange. Mm -hmm. This application is requesting to rezone the property from that R5 large lot residential to a mix of single unit lots as seen in yellow, one and two unit dwelling lots as seen in orange, and high density residential as seen in pink. This conceptual plan is shown on the screen, or that as shown on the screen, does not yet show the 5% parkland dedication that's required for subdivision approval. However, that will be negotiated at the subdivision stage. Speaking of stages, the process of development from conceptual plan to a developed subdivision has many moving parts, can take multiple years, and involves various departments, and can be complex. I'd like to take this time to go through a very general overview of the development process to provide some insight into the overall progression and when specific technical elements are required to be submitted for review. Starting at the tentative subdivision approval stage, the applicant will submit a plan which will be reviewed by the different departments in town hall. As a collective, we will review the proposal in a more detailed form, focusing on the road layout, the proposed lots, ensuring that they meet the land use bylaw zone requirements for areas and frontage. We will look at technical details such as the exact pipe dimensions and elevations of the infrastructure and detailed stormwater management plans. And finally, we will negotiate the 5% parkland dedication requirement. When successful, the applicant will receive approval on their tentative subdivision plan, which is valid for a length of two years. Then the placement of infrastructure and construction of the road begins, where the developer will work with a site inspector to ensure the project is adhering to the plan approved by the town, and they will ensure at this time that any as-built record information is captured by a surveyor to convey to the town for asset management purposes. Once construction of the road is complete, we enter into the final subdivision approval stage as noted in the bottom there. The town will enter into a subdivision, subdivision agreement with the developer and we as the town will begin receiving any as-built record drawings for the new roads, any deeds for the roads and parkland, and the final plan of subdivision for the roads, parkland, and individual lots to be created. Once lots are approved and registered with the land registry office, development permits can be applied for and the construction of individual develop, uh, dwellings commences. There were some concerns expressed during last month's meeting whether or not the town had enabling policies within the municipal planning strategy to allow for these sorts of rezonings. At this point, I'd like to remind everyone of the generalized future land use map excerpt that was identified a few slides back showing the majority of land in this area being designated as residential. Section 15.6 of the Municipal Planning Strategy talks about instances when MPS amendments are not required. I'd like to highlight the first paragraph of this section. It reads, the generalized future land use map designates the overall general land, use, land uses that are permitted in various areas throughout town. Residential rezonings, for example, will only be considered by council if the property in question is within the area designated residential on the generalized future land use map. In order for council to approve a rezoning that does not fall within the appropriate designation, the property owner would have to propose a concurrent amendment to both the MPS and the LUB. Sections 15.9.2 
titled rezonings and sections 15.9.2.1 uh, titled rezoning application requirements along with policy IM-7 outlines the specific requirements of any rezoning application that is brought forward for consideration. Further questions have been asked about the commitments from the developer when the original lots were sold. The town is not at liberty to uphold any commitments made by the developer to individual property owners. Additionally, any covenants put in place by the developer are not enforced by the town. Covenants are a binding agreement that runs with the property, regardless of ownership, and if not followed, can result in complaints and legal action against the owner of the property. Covenants are to be enforced by the developer. The concerns of residents as it pertains to the addition of multi-unit buildings within the subdivision is understandable. However, as the demand for housing changes, it is important that the town remains responsive to the needs of our community. With the provincial government's goal to grow the population of our province to 2 million by the year 2060, the most cost-effective way that we can help our community with this goal is by enabling high-density development. Getting back to the site in the conceptual plan, there are, was some confusion last month regarding the proposal as it relates to the existing community. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide some context. There will be access points to this development from the following existing roads, from McDonald Park Road through Carlton Drive, from Mount Vincent Drive, the new road in the subdivision, from Acadia Drive, from Acadia Drive through a new unnamed street identified as Street A on the concept plan, and then eventually from the proposed Donald E. Hiltz Connector Road once it's constructed. We heard comments around the number of proposed single unit dwelling zoned lots. We have worked very closely with the applicant to encourage the use of single unit zones properties adjacent to existing single unit zone properties to ensure compatibility within the existing neighborhood. The applicant and developer have been receptive to these requests and have worked with the planning department to get to a point where we believe there are ample R1 zoned laws in this proposal. I'd also like to take this time to acknowledge that single unit dwellings are still permitted within the one and two unit dwelling zone as well. At the March CAC meeting, there was concern expressed around the proposed development and the slopes in excess of 25% as identified on the environmental constraints overlay map, which is map number three of the MPS. To provide a clear understanding of how these steep slopes relate to the proposed development, I've compiled an additional map with the concept plan georeference to the subject property with the 25% slopes layer overlaid. The squiggly shapes identified as the burnt orange um, are representative of these steep slopes of over 25% that are in question. So you can see how they're, they're there, but they're um, mostly away from the buildings that are being proposed um, and we'll work with the developer to make sure that that's looked at very closely. On to sidewalks and connectivity. At this moment in time, the Kempville subdivision bylaw only requires the construction of sidewalks on new arterial roads. This is a result of an amendment in 2008. However, the traffic impact study provided by Galco Traffic Engineering does recommend the construction of a sidewalk from this new phase of Acadia Drive to the proposed Donald E. Hiltz Road. Furthermore, it is worthwhile for council to note um, that the active transportation plan prepared by Upland Planning in 2019 re recommends an amendment to our subdivision bylaw to add the requirement for sidewalks on new collector roads, which Acadia Drive has been designated as since its inception. I'd also like to note that the town's priority for parkland dedication through the past several years has been to ensure connectivity between roads and subdivisions in the absence of sidewalks on our local roads. Questions relating to stormwater management were also brought up during the March CAC meeting. Nova Scotia Environment Standards and the Kempville Subdivision Bylaw outlines the responsibility of the developer to predict the direction of, flow, of water flow and associated volumes, and to ensure that minimum grading standards are employed in the drainage design of the lot so as to not negatively impact the surrounding community. The responsibility to construct the required grades on each lot rests with the lot builder. The builder needs to ensure that water is directed towards the street or the rear lot line and that no building line grade shall be lower than the street grades design. 
As always, if residents are unclear who to contact during stormwater issues, they are encouraged to reach out to the town to get clarification. Essentially, if there is an issue between two private properties, it becomes a civil matter between those two par parties. And if there is an issue between the public right of way or town properties and a private property, then the property owner is encouraged to reach out to the town and let us know of the issue so that we can work towards a resolution. A few questions were raised on the ability for staff to consider a part of this development by a process called development agreement. Policy GD5 of the Municipal Planning Strategy outlines the specific circumstances where staff can consider development agreements. The policy reads as follows. It shall be the intention of council that the following uses be permitted only by development agreement in accordance with the MGA and policies IM10 and IM11. This is, gets a little bit wordy, so I apologize. Mini home parks, land lease communities in the large lot residential zone. The change of use or change in use of a non-conforming use of land or a non-conforming use in a structure to another non-conforming use and the expansion, enlargement, or alteration of a non-conforming structure. In summary, at this moment, there is no supporting language to consider multi-unit dwellings by a development agreement. Lastly, I'd like to provide a comment around our educational facilities. Staff have engaged the Director of Operations for Annapolis Valley Regional Center for Education and have received a comment regarding the proposed development. The Director of Operations has stated that projected student enrollment data through 2027 indicates near capacity er enrollment for KCA with available capacity at NECAC. However, AVRCE is confident that they can respond to potential enrollment increases associated with a subject application for rezoning and potential future development. This includes school capacity as well as student transportation. At this time, AVRCE has no other concerns or comments related to this application. Should council wish to be proactive with the future planning for schools within the area, it would be recommended to consider zoning an area of land as institutional for additional education, educational facilities when the town eventually enters into a secondary planning strategy process. And that is my report. Thank you. So folks, I think um, what might make sense here is to open it up for questions. Um, I know that we were provided with the report, uh, but it was uh, this morning. So I think some of us didn't have much of an opportunity to review it, um, but I know that more information was being gathered. So we understand the lateness of it. So I'm going to open it up for discussion and uh, Councillor Gerard, you have the floor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, and I, I was just like, I think most where I this is sort of the first time I've seen this um, one question that I would ask either the CAO or um, um, Kirsten is in regards to the Annapolis Valley um, education piece could they give us more information my, my fear is on that part of it is that they come back with a Kempel's got to pay for this or Kempel's got to pay for that in order to expand it, if, if they could be a little bit more clear on um, on uh, how they think they can accommodate more students. Um, thank you. And so I think um, I think the the growth that is going to happen outside of even this project that we're talking about here in Kenful is going to be significant. Um, and particularly once we, we do have access to the, the larger tracts of land that you saw there in, in orange that are R5, uh, the reality of it is I think as part of a secondary plan, which is actually in, in, in the upcoming budget here in the town, um, there is a real, uh, I believe, need to set aside some land which would be considered institutional with the idea that then that leaves the door open for uh, the province to come in and say, if a new, a, a full fledged school is needed outside of the incremental approach, which, you know, uh, are different areas are going through while they're waiting for that to happen. Um, but I believe that they're recognizing and is that the potential growth here is such that, um, you know, what they have is immediate 
projection, so you know, X number of starts per year, as that number goes up exponentially, a secondary plan with a zoning area for a school would give them a lot more flexibility than with regards to those conversations with the province. Thank you. Councilor York. Thank you. Kristen, I appreciate the absolute tome of a document you put together here. So thank you again for your continued effort. I know this doesn't happen overnight, so I appreciate the work that you've put into it to date and the information that likely came from other departments as well. So thank you to everyone who's done that so far. Um, again, I haven't had a chance to go through it as well as I would like to have gone through it um, because there is a lot here. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, in my quick skim, and apologies if it is in here and I just haven't um, read it thoroughly enough. Um, is there anything from the developer or from the town as it relates to transit in a new subdivision like this and the impacts of transit, like things like King's Transit and moving people when we have um, a development of this size? Um, I don't believe that at this point, um, and I don't, I don't think that would necessarily be something that would fall on, on the developer. I think it's a conversation that uh, King's Transit and King's Point to Point as part of their pilot right now, they're looking at the expansion of the services and it would really fall under the purview of as these different, as these different opportunities are coming along of larger scale that it's on their radar screen so that'd be part of their planning. The key right now on the, on the transit side or on the, on the, um, the movement of, of larger, um, larger numbers of individuals through mass transit um, is that there is an opportunity coming through federal provincial streams to purchase the right size buses. Mm -hmm. And so that exercise is part of the work that is about six months into a 24 month process. And so uh, this would feed into the work that they're doing to identify bus routes, size of the bus buses and frequency of those buses as part of that work. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. I, um, I want to commend Kirsten on, I did read through this before, before council tonight and um, your presentation really uh, put everything into a nutshell and made it much more easy to understand. So okay. thank you very much for th that work. Congratulate your other uh, colleagues as well because uh, I, I really like the condensing of that uh, large document. So Fantastic. I really appreciated that. Um, CAO, maybe you can once more say the name of the person who um, was with C&D community planning and consultant who helped to, to go through those documents? Sure, her name is Carolyn Robertson. So we actually, uh, we started this process, there's a gentleman, and if anybody, uh, um, a gentleman by the name of Morris Lloyd, who actually was the planner for a company in McDougal Heights, back during its original development. And so we had some original conversations with him and then he supported the work um, to go, then go to uh, Carolyn Robertson. So. Carolyn over the weekend supplied us with a lot of information and I want to thank her for uh, her work over an Easter weekend and there will be more conversations obviously that uh, Ms. Duncan will be having uh, with her just kind of finishing up some pieces around that but it's uh, Carolyn Robertson C, C plus D, keep on saying C and D, C plus D community design who, uh, who supported the work. Thank you very much. I appreciate that and again thank you so much for condensing it down so I could understand it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions before I go ahead? No? Oh, okay. Um, so I just have a, a, I don't know if they're comments or questions, but probably a little bit of both. Um, so when you talk about the slopes that are in excess of 25%, but that they're not close to the buildings that are proposed. You're talking about the buildings that are proposed, the high density, correct? Uh, yes, it's around the uh, two unit um, as well, the one and two unit zone. Um, Jennifer, would I be able to get the screens again? Sure. 
So um, as you can see, the, the burnt orange um, shapes or polygons, whatever you want to call them, those identify, they're taken from um, a LIDAR data set, which is flown by the province, and that shows our um, elevations on the ground. So what we did was we uh, did an analysis to extract any slopes that were in excess of 25%, and that's what you see overlaid on top of it. So. Um, I'm not sure if I can get a pointer up here, but there are some that uh, go along the backside of some R2 uh, zoned properties. Um, and then as well, uh, down along the Mitchell Brook water course, you can see there are some of those slopes present, um, which is no surprise because we know that that is quite a gully in through there. Um, so they, they are definitely present on site, but they're not in any way at this moment impeding uh, development abilities. And then, so the draining issue um, is, that's provincially regulated, right? Like it's not, I, I guess what I'm asking is, are there, is, does Kenful have something as to how they regulate it or does it only have to be regulated according to the province? So our subdivision bylaw does speak to some stormwater management requirements. Mm -hmm. um, we do recognize internally that it, our subdivision bylaw is from 2002 and likely will need some updating, um, mm -hmm. at which time we can definitely incorporate some new um, mechanisms that are utilized in other areas of the province. Um, but we're also acknowledging that Nova Scotia environment as a whole does um, require um, a net zero approach to development on site. So that just essentially means that there's, between the pre-development and post-development, there's no negative impact to the surrounding uh, community from stormwater. Okay. Um, when you talk about the development agreement and that there is no supporting language that would be applicable to, to this development, um, Could that language change? Could could a DA eventually uh, apply to something like this in terms of seeing the entire plan developed, meaning meaning the entire forty three point two acres? So I think at this point in time, um, with the secondary planning strategy idea and, and that process coming up, um, we can definitely look at including more instances where development agreements can be considered. Mm -hmm. um, but as it stands right now with this application in front of us, we just don't have that as a mechanism to, to rely on. Go ahead. If I can add, um, I think it's important to remember that all of um, these um, R5 lands, the intention was for residential use. And so a DA would normally be something you would use is if it was non-conforming to one of those uses so if council decided and um and and pick you know uh, if it became commercial activity or or something um i think in the in the case here everything is very much specific to um residential and whether it's whether it's a single lot or multi-unit and uh, I think the, the broader question for council will be when we do the secondary plan is going forward, is this the approach that council likes or do they want to consider development agreements? So for example, if certain uh, lands in the future got rezoned and uh, council wanted to make sure DA existed on a multi-unit, that's, that's a decision at that time. What's before us, though, is that everything in this uh, application conforms with the request that a previous council obviously made with regards to what they wanted to see in R5. Okay. Thank you. I see Councillor Maxwell. If you'll indulge me, Councillor, just for one more second, I just wanted to ask one more thing, and it was with respect to... Um, the thought around limiting any kind of traffic through there, whether it be like heavy duty trucks or anything like that, if that was ever discussed with the developer or dis discussed amongst uh, staff. I, I think the, the biggest determination during construction would be um, if the proposed connector, the timing of that. And okay. the reason that I say that is because it becomes the more obvious way 
to be, particularly when you get into the larger scale of construction, to be sure. bringing materials in or removing materials versus um, <clears throat> anything that would be R1 or R2 would be much smaller in scale. Sure. And not that there wouldn't be activity, uh, but it would not be the same kind of activity if you were doing like a constant pour for a multi-unit uh, building. Sure. So again, I think it just comes down to timing um, on whether there would be any real activity on uh, Acadia and whether access to the construction would come from the south instead of from the north. Okay, thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think I read um, that Carolyn Robertson recommended that we look as, uh, as our planning department look at um, maybe some changes with stormwater and uh, using the green uh, green ways of, of handling stormwater management and so on. Um, will we do that? We w will our planning department go ahead and start looking at making those changes and making sure that we're, we're following the green, like green, I don't know what you call it. Green infrastructure. Green infrastructure, yeah. yeah. Like she recommended that and yeah. so, yeah. I think it's definitely worthwhile um, exploring all options. Um, I'll obviously defer to our director of engineering to give us some expertise on that, um, but absolutely um, not throwing anything out that could be uh, a benefit to our community. Right, great. Okay. Councillor Huntley. Thank you. Um, I guess I probably have a hundred questions since I actually read that report. Uh, so I'll just throw out a, a few. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Certainly. Um, the first thing is, I know there has been a traffic study. It was mentioned. Um, and the info that has come from that, is the, has that been out to the public yet? Or the, what, what part has been done? Sorry. So, so the traffic study certainly is something that obviously can be made available. There were some folks from um, McDougal Heights who were looking for information that was provided okay. to them. Right. Yeah. Um, and obviously um, appreciate that in this case it's the developer who has prepared this and, yes. and paid for it as part of this process. Sure. Um, but I believe that there also is some comment in there with regards to what C plus D consulting had done with regards to it as well. Thank you. Um, the other uh, couple of questions. One is, um, one's a comment actually, and I, at, in reading through the report, I did like the comments about the sustainable transportation options, mm -hmm. um, and I probably have 900 questions about that, so I won't even go into that tonight. Um, the other thing, when they talk about the stormwater runoff, um, I, I will say that <laughs> I, I'm worried about water. Mm -hmm. um, however, I can't speak to who the previous developer would be years ago who built up that way before I moved here, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess in moving forward, that's one of my focuses, just to make sure that uh, there's really concentration on that piece, because I know the frustration of being a homeowner when you see that water come down through. It's like, oh, where's it gonna go, yeah, right? Absolutely. So, um, okay, and um, sorry, I'll say that's it for now, because yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So if I could, and I, first of all, thank you, Ms. Duncan. I appreciate it. I yes. appreciate your efforts thank on the you. Easter weekend for us. <laughs> I really do. It's my pleasure. A lot of work. Um, and uh, so recognizing a few councillors um, have some reading to do, but we also don't want to lose momentum in this coming to, to council. So I think it's important that council receive this report tonight, so not to table it, but to receive the report so that that report can then come back to council. And at that point, council will have a decision. Either you can take it to first reading at the meeting or if there's additional pieces, but will we keep moving this forward? And so if council receives this report from Ms. Duncan this evening and the work that was done by C plus D, then um, council can consider it for first reading or have the opportunity if there's more questions to feed them through to staff and we certainly are happy to bring them to the next meeting. Thank you, CAO. And thank you, Ms. Duncan, for all your work um, and your efforts on this. So folks, is everybody comfortable with that, receiving the report and, uh, and uh, discussing it further at the next council meeting at the end of this month? And or consider for first reading. 
and or consider for first reading. Okay. Okay, I have consensus, good. Thank you. All right, we'll go into the next report, which is Parks and Recreation. Good evening, Council. I feel bad that I haven't brought you nice maps, but Kirsten has that skill, <laughs> not me. Um, just a few things I wanted to highlight around my report. You've uh, hopefully had a chance to read it all, but I did want to bring a few things to your attention. Um, under the Homeless No More piece, and I know a few folks have been waiting for this update, on May 25th, uh, we will be holding the, the next piece of the conversation for decision makers. So this is included, uh, including elected officials. Um, and folks in positions of power to be able to have a conversation around the data that you would have received when, uh, when Alicia spoke at our last meeting. Um, and then also uh, there's gonna be um, some calls to action and um, to everybody in turn, including um, uh, um, just a kind of a re-emphasis on the fact that the call to actions and the decisions that we're bringing forward have actually come from the organizations that are doing the work. Um, this is really the job of Homeless No More is to help amplify those voices. This is one of the things that they've asked of us to say that we're so busy on the ground supporting people who are in state of crisis that we're looking for, um, uh, an, uh, uh, for folks to kind of amplify our voices. So that's kind of the general idea of Homeless No More. Um, so what you hear is kind of real time. I wanted to bring to your attention Spike Fund. I feel like I've been really uh, overly confident. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we received a slew of applications. So 31 fully processed applications, and that was at the time of this report. There have been more that have come in, um, and that was for 2022-23 with the total uh, dollar amount given out of $3,875.19. Um, there are an additional 10 applicants that have been received and are in the process of being processed and reviewed. So a total of 41. Last year we had nine. Um, so our funds are running thin. It's a reminder to everybody that this is a donation-based um, uh, fund that people can access. Um, so uh, just that's a little call out to say that as we go into the summer months, which is arguably one of our busiest seasons, we're, we're really low on funds. Um, the other thing that you'll see coming out with the spike fund application is that we've actually revamped the form. Um, and that's uh, with the idea that we just want to collect different types of data. So we want to know who we're hitting, but also just as important, who aren't we hitting with our spike fund? Because um, there's people that, though we've tried to make it as accessible as possible, we want to make sure that um, folks that aren't accessing it understand that it's there for them and how to do it. The other thing that we've been working on is an anti-discrimination and anti-racism policy. So you will be seeing that um, in the next coming meetings. Um, uh, and this will be added to our HR manual. Um, under facilities, uh, so we heard last uh, from the last meeting from a few councillors that wanted more information around uh, future decisions with regards to our facilities and the state of our facilities. So I just wanted to put a little bookmark in here that um, staff have been working on bringing a, a presentation back to you for the next meeting. And that's going to take a broader look and kind of paint the story of where we are with our facilities, what we've heard from community, uh, and, and what are the opportunities that we think exist. You'll also see this when the operating budget is presented to you, that we want to do um, a bit more of a, of a fleshing out and filling in the gaps of that story, but um, we're slowly pulling that together. So expect that at the next council meeting. Um, and just a friendly reminder that we still have invasive species in Kenful when it comes to our parks. And the invasive species, the hemlock woolly adelgid that was found in the gorge, has now been found in the ravine. You will see that represented in the operating budget as it is presented to you. And a few things on the last page under council related. Um, the Kenful uh, Active Transportation Plan. Um, and certainly Director Bell can help me out here if I'm missing anything. But there is an internal committee. Uh, we meet regularly from each department to see how this is going to um, impact each department and, and to make sure that everything is on the table, including accessibility when it comes to how we're moving forward. Um, and there will be a lot more engagement that you'll see from this moving forward, um, including if Kirsten has some time, some really pretty maps. She's really good at that, as you can tell. Um, but this year for the 23-24 lineup, we're talking about the completion of the multi-use pathway through the downtown, um, the outer section of the sidewalk and crossings that is replaced around the downtown, the downtown square, so kind of the outside of it. Um, 
uh, what else is going to happen this year? So there's going to be uh, the intersection of Main Street and West Main will be updated. And then the other sections include Klondike entrance to Miner's Marsh, the crossing of the multi-use trail on West Main Street, and the addition of on-street signage and line painting. That's throughout town, including in different neighborhoods. Um, a completed project outline will be included in the next council package that will flesh out each of those projects. And that's my report. Great. Thank you very much, Director Bedingfield. Does anybody have any questions for the director? Councillor Huntley. Hi, Rachel. Hello. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the number of uh, requests this year, which is 41 for the spike fund. If you had to um, do a guesstimation of all those requests in dollar figure, of you know the, what, what is it they want to rent, what do you think that that would add up to? So out of the 41 could, I, I don't know what, what you rent, like swimming passes or new sneakers or, you know, what would a dollar figure come under those 41 requests? So the spike fund can be accessed for um, really anything that addresses barriers to participation. So yep. we've funded everything from um, hiking boots to be able to, to walk in and, and in, in I can remember a few particular cases and I think I mentioned it here where people are wanting they don't have a vehicle so they want to walk to their doctor's appointment um, though it's an AT piece we consider it recreation so we'll fund those okay. to I need goggles um, I found another grant source so I'm able to get an Acadia swim pass I just need a bathing suit mm -hmm. um, to uh, to um, uh, you know, home weights um, because they can't afford a gym membership to all of these different pieces. Sure. So the, the spike fund matches or caps out at two hundred dollars per individual per year. That's all that we're allotting folks, and very few times is that not the request. We have not been able to fulfill all of the the money just because we're we're paring it down a little bit because we we see it the request coming in faster than we can keep up with. So. Um, sometimes it's only $100 that we give people, but that is also a big help in a lot of ways. Okay. When you look at the application form, we also ask folks, um, if, if any, if they're possible, uh, what is their contribution to it? So it's also this piece that we're working together to ensure that everybody has access okay. um, to that. So usually they're around between 150 and 200. Thank you. Councillor Chair. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, the Woody Adelgid. Um, Berwick has it, yeah, it's and they've been treating it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the the pesticide course I was on last month, they were talking about because uh, the the guy that gave the course actually, he's not heading it up, but he is um, he's uh, he's helping. And I, I guess are we starting soon to treat them? I know we had talked about it. So that really depends on money. Uh, so you'll see a budget line um, that's around $40,000. That's almost half of what we would need to treat just the gorge. Okay. Um, and the other question I have is, and I don't know much about the Woody Adelgid and how it transfers. Um, so if it's here and it's here, can we assume that it's all through? I, I don't know whether it goes by wind or they fly or what medium they, they move, so. Yeah, all of the above. And if you have seen both at the Marsh and at the Gorge, we have uh, boot cleaning stations mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, recommend that people bring rollers with them because it comes down from above. Um, and then it's, it's transferred quite easily, actually. Um, yeah, it's, okay. it's a really unfortunate. We're, we're also um, trying to work, um, and I say we, when I say we, I mean like the broader friends of the Kenfield Library, or uh, Ravine, which again, as I repeat here often, are filled with very smart people, um, are helping us work with the uh, research station um, to figure out what solutions exist and what is best here. But it's also really important to, to know what Berwick is doing, what Truro is doing, what other regions are doing. There doesn't seem to be one overall governing body where um, park professionals can kind of come in and address this together. Um, what the federal government is doing in Parks Canada down in Kedgee is different than what's happening um, up in Guysboro County is different than what's happening here. So um, that's part of the work that's being done is let's actually come together. What is available? What grants are available? Which we actually don't really exist, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so we're starting to work together, but you can sl see it slowly ch -ch 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 going across the province. And it, it will, it has the potential to wipe out the gorge. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm. 
Thank you. Um, Director Bedingfield, uh, just I'll sort of go back to Councillor Huntley's question about the, um, about the, um, oh my gosh, the spike fund, sorry. <laughs> um, how, much, how much would you like to have? How much would be helpful to have that would do us for the rest of the year? So the spike fund every year starts in the budget line as $3,000 with the intent that we fundraise for $3,000. So it's an in and out for the town of Kenful. It's okay. just a way to hold the space. Um, up until this year, that's been suffice. We've been able to, through things like the Swimming with the Mermaids event or, or on your camp registration, you can give a donation. We've been able to fill that need. Um, I would say we need to probably plan for at least 5,000 moving forward, if not 10. So, so that would be five to ten thousand that would come from the community. I, with the with the amount that yeah. we're growing, it's it's all a bit okay. much. I do want to say too. So there's two different pieces to this. So the spike fund is to help people access recreation that don't have access. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we're working on that is a little bit more upstream, if you will, is the and it was in the report. Um, is updating the rec for all policy. So mm -hmm. we need to just generally talk about how people are accessing recreation, which is defined as your quality of life. So we, if we're committed to people thriving in the town of Kenfield, mm -hmm. then we need to actually take that as a priority and talk about how we make it more accessible so that um, we're not just tr asking people to apply for money to get one part of their, of their, uh, their thriving bank, if you will. Okay. Yeah, so it's important to note that there's, we're, we're trying to work on all streams here. Okay, great, thank you. All right, no more questions, great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the next report we have is the Chief's report, and I suspect you will get that, Sienna. Uh Well, the Chief's not here this evening. Okay. He's actually at a meeting of Nova Scotia Chiefs. Okay. And uh, I believe the deputy chief is with him. So okay. uh, the re council has the report. And if there's any questions that folks would like taken back, happy to do so. I don't see any. So we'll move right along to engineering and uh, public works. Director Bell. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you and good evening council. Um, I'll start as I often do, or always do, I guess, with the Water, Kempel Water Commission. Um, later this month, the Kempel Water Commission will have both our regular quarterly meeting and a special budget meeting uh, to present the operating and uh, capital Water Commission budgets. Operationally, in March, there were no issues with the Water Commission. Uh, similarly, under the Sanitary Sewer Area Service, uh, there were no, no issues operationally. Um, under Public Works, the month of March had a higher than average snow and ice accumulation and used up a good portion of our previously forecast uh, surplus of that snow and ice portion of the operating budget. On March 21st, uh, a geotechnical firm along with a, dr a drilling company uh, completed three boreholes on the road adjacent to the slope failure on Canaan Avenue uh, that has kept a section of that street closed uh, since mid-January. Although we haven't received the report yet, uh, I was present for the geotech investigation most of the day and uh, the road bed itself appears to be in good condition um, and the failure looks to be localized to the sidewalk area. Um, having said that, we, we will keep the road closed because uh, as we're into, into the spring here now and, and rainy season, um, there is still the, the risk uh, that some of that slope could creep into the road bed. So we're going to keep, for safety's sake, keep uh, the barricades barricades up on the uh, either side of that of that issue. Um, once we receive the report and recommendations, we'll better know the best method of repair, and we'll work on an appropriate design. Much <clears throat> much of my month of March was spent working on both capital and operating budgets. The finance department has been busy compiling the data submitted from the various departments uh, to complete the 23-24 operating budget, which will be presented to council at an upcoming special CAC meeting. Under traffic authority, uh, nothing, nothing to report this month. Um, and under projects, uh, the next phases of both the McDonald Avenue subdivision rebuild and the section of last year's uncompleted uh, AT project, as Director Bedingfield mentioned, uh, through Station Lane um, to the, uh, uh, the rest of that section through the downtown connector for the uh, multi-use pathway are both set to resume in the coming weeks. Um, I've spoken to both, both contractors and they're uh, getting ready to mobilize now. Uh, the communication team will post updates on our Facebook and web page as we receive updated schedules from the contractors. 
Um, preliminary design is now underway on some upcoming capital projects that we have outlined in our previous capital budget meetings. Tenders recently closed uh, on a previously approved single axle uh, plow and salt truck that uh, we approved back in the fall to be purchased under this, this year's uh, capital uh, budget season. So the, uh, the, complete, the completed, assembled and outfitted package came in under the budgeted $400,000. So we are proceeding with the, uh, the ordering of that truck. Still be almost Christmas before we see that in our yard, ideally. Uh, be late fall when the, when the truck gets built and then it has to go for, for outfitting um, to, the, uh, to the plow company that, that puts on the, uh, the body and the plow and the wing and all the controls. So it'll still be um, probably December at best before we receive it, but ideally it won't snow before then. And even <laughs> if it does, we still have our, our, our two trucks, one, one of which will be uh, um, retired, I guess, and, uh, and tried to be sold for surplus once we get the second truck uh, operational. And that is my report. Thank you very much, Director Bell. Welcome. I see there are a few questions here. Lights. Councillor York, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm wondering if you have an ETA for or anticipated date for that report for Canaan Avenue to come back? I don't. It, so it's been, you know, uh, mm -hmm. what did I say, 21st of March, I yeah. think? Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's been, that's been going on three weeks, uh, three weeks today, I think, uh, since it was the investigation was done. Should see that here in the next in the next uh, one to two weeks, um, and I'll follow up with, with the uh, with the consultant consultant uh, rather uh, this week to see where that is. Once we have that, we'll know we'll know better what the best uh, best repair method is. Um, it'll be a, a retaining wall of some form, whether that's precast or or sheet pile, something along along the bank. To uh, as I mentioned, the good news was the road itself. Um, has no signs of failure. The, it was dry and compact. There's no no wa no water uh, running under the road. They went down 20, 20 plus feet in three different boreholes, um, sort of in the middle of that outside lane closest to the failure. Uh, so everything looks really good under the road itself, which was promising. I was fearful that the road r road was compromised, and that was the start of the failure. It appears that that's not the case, but the report will, will outline that more. But we should see that report certainly this month, uh, the latest. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, would the work on that retaining wall then begin almost immediately? Has she to be designed and tendered and, you know, right. nothing, nothing happens quickly, but certainly this <laughs> this summer okay. construction season. Um, okay. But uh, I don't foresee the road opened until until late summer at the earliest, uh, okay. Councillor York. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, one I'd just like to know, I was walking past Me Road and that development up there. Right. Um, and I noticed the different holes that are, you know, capped now and, and that whole feet that looks like a, like a, it's not a minefield, but it, <laughs> that's kind of what it looks like. What, what is that? Is that? Uh, that's their stormwater management area. So uh, it'll become, it'll become our, well, we still haven't taken the road over yet. So the road itself is still, um, in the process of being turned over to us, so um, they they're cons it's considered now to be a just part of the development. They've paved it and, and curbed it. Uh, so that stormwater management area, as we've mentioned in all developments now, um, need to have that net zero effect on downstream uh, discharges. So um, there's many methods to do that. Like you see, under parking lots, say um, you know the dealerships out on Park Street, they put put them under the parking lot because they can sort of double the use of that space put cars on it and have the, that management. In this case, they put sort of a, um, a farm or an array of, of uh, concrete tanks mm -hmm. there and they're all interconnected um, and they, they will hold the stormwater event uh, and release it slowly uh, through a smaller pipe uh, to, the, to the receiving water, which is to the north, uh, north ditch, I guess, on, uh, on Me Road. Uh, so that's, that's a stormwater management area. Um, a, an example of many different types that can be built, but that's the method they used uh, in their design. And uh, uh, you know, we're 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 sort of watching it because again, it isn't ours. And, and if we see any deficiencies in the, uh, it's kind of nice that we don't own it yet. We're uh, mm -hmm. we're watching the the, uh, the first Looks sort of the first spring. Yeah, I mean, and they can you know they they can't build on that one. That 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 will be a um, um, an easement in our favor, so we can have access to it. But mm -hmm. I think that land is going to be kept. Um, as part of the development and they can use that for, for amenity space or the backyards of the 
future buildings that will go along that uh, that new So road. they could eventually cover that all over, could they? Can be covered to a, an extent. It's not covered right now. Um, it, it needs to be accessible um, mm -hmm. for for when we do take it over. So mm -hmm. we need to maintain it if there's anything that that needs to be uh, you know everything needs a little bit of maintenance. The first the first number of years should be should be low maintenance. But um, what we need to do is keep keep uh, any road sands and things in the catch basins that are in the street. So those all have sumps in them. So ideally that stuff doesn't get into the, into the system itself and would make it, makes it easier to, to deal with it uh, uh, in the street than, than in that, um, in that stormwater area, but they still need to maintain it, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, service it as required. So is that kind of what we would be looking at up in McDougall Heights? Would it be the same it, sort of thing, or would it be slightly different? Could be, it could be a variety of things. Um, you know, the norm years ago was more of an open, open stormwater management pond. Um, and ponds can be dry ponds or, or ponds that hold water all the time. Dry ponds often are, are dry, so that, that um, they're basically a grassy bottom um, under, the, under the normal dry weather events. And then, they, they would fill up into in a rain event and, and then release it slowly. Um, ponds can have, can have pros, and, pros and cons um, uh, as opposed to these uh, underground tankage. Um, you know, you have the, the risk of water, open water, and things like of that nature. But they could, done right, they can be actually features in a, in a, mm -hmm. in a development having, uh, cause you, can, you can have them where they have, they have water all the time. You can put, you know, fountains and things in them and, and just have the, the upper, Level of the pond, sized rates to take the to take the overflow from from uh, large rain events. So, could be a variety of things in uh, future developments, but uh, something of that nature. Yeah. Okay, and and you probably know that we we were we got a video and some pictures from. She did the I just saw it for the first time today, actually. And yeah. and so you know this is the water issue. And can can you explain to me a little bit about what's going on there and. Uh, it, do, can we do something about that, or you know, is is what's causing that, and so on? There's a couple things. What you saw in the video um, was water coming down uh, Mount Vincent, which only has one lift of asphalt on. Uh, so the developer, uh, in all streets, when we when when they're built by the developer, the last last ten plus years, it's been the, the responsibility of the developer to pave and curb the street at their expense. We used to we used to cover the paving. Um, to encourage development years ago, when when, when development uh, development was slow, and, and to encourage that, so and now now it's all their responsibility. So before we take a road over, they have to pave the base course of asphalt and curb the street. So the only thing that they can have is a deficiency, and and in bond they give us a uh, performance bond of 120 percent to put that future lift of asphalt on, mm -hmm. and they do it do it themselves unless you know the reason we take the bond is if. Uh, they're no longer a business or, or anything like that, then we can, we can pave it ourselves. Typically it's done, you know, year two, year three of a development. Um, that development's been there now for, I guess, two years, I think it's been approved. Um, but there's still, I think, four homes built and 20-ish lots left mm -hmm. to be built on. So, you know, a lot of heavy trucks yet to go in there, concrete trucks and, and, and as those homes are built. So we're not in any big hurry to see the top lift of pavement go on. Once it does, that will allow that street water to get to the gutters and into the, into the storm sewer as, it was, as it's designed. Right now it's running down the sort of the seam between that lip of asphalt and the concrete gutter and running all the way to the bottom of Mount Vincent where it meets mm -hmm. Acadia. That's one of the issues you saw on, the, on, that, on that video. That's what I saw. And some of the still photos showed um, a lot on the corner that's been there for 15 years, I guess, um, undeveloped lot owned by one of the developers. That lot actually, even though it, it looks, can look bad as far as the, the amount of water that it holds during a, a rain event. I mean, one of the pictures I think was dated from that uh, mid-January rain event that we had when we lost Canaan Avenue. Mm -hmm. We had three inches of rain in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, that lot actually is acting as a, as a retention area. Um, might not have been the original plan, but I see that lot probably, it, it'll probably sit there as, as undeveloped, I suspect, until some of the more desirable lots are gone. But at that time, um, you know, it'll be filled in, brought up to the, to the curb level, because it sits about two feet below the curb, so it's, it's holding an amount of water. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a catch basin in there that the, that the developer put in to, 
to, uh, to help lower the water level on that lot as it builds up. But of course that has leaves and snow on it during, during, the, during the winter events and uh, that's why that was holding that much water. But I see that actually, you know, uh, it's a good thing that it's holding water right now uh, until those rest of those lots are developed and the, right. and the street is paved. The silt on the street, uh, again, was coming down, um, you know, prior to those, all those lots now, uh, they've, they've clear cut a lot of the lots from the new, new, to new homes being built up there. Um, and they haven't fully vegetated them back yet. They've tried to establish lawns and things, but most of that silt is coming off the, the new private properties. I mean, that was all, uh, it was vegetated before and it'll be vegetated again. It's just gonna be more lawns and, and property, you know, and finished properties, but uh, that's what's hitting the, the street. And again, it isn't getting into the catch basins, it's running down the, running down the asphalt to the bottom of, uh, of Acadia and Mount Pinson intersection. Um, the catch basins are designed to hold, um, you know, you have a foot and a half, typically uh, sump in every catch basin to catch that silt and keep it out of the storm system. And then we use our street sweeper to suck that out. Um, but that, that's why you don't see it on a normal basis because it ends up in the catch basin as opposed to what it's doing now. Um, but it's not a flooding issue. It's just, you know, it's an in-between development. It's, it's okay. incomplete in the sense of the asphalt's not, not uh, don't have fully, fully paved and, uh, and that lot at the bottom, I said, is acting as a, as a retention lot, which uh, is actually a plus in my opinion. And are those point. houses, those vacant lots or whatever, are those part of the, the parcel of land that we're looking at rezoning or is that a separate? That's no, they, separate they're all, um, that one on the corner. Subdivision that, thing. Sub, it's not, yeah, they, they've been approved lots now for, for a single, there was, those in the R1 zone, they're single family lots that have been approved now for, uh, well that corner one, it's been there for 10 plus years and then the new street, uh, Mount Vincent, just for the last two years or less that it's been approved. So they, uh, so they different are, developers. They are different developers, um, okay. just bordering on the, on the rezone. Okay, good, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Councilor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, not about any development that's been talked about tonight, but just large developments in general. Um, do we have a standard that we require the road to be paved to? If, what I'm getting at is do we go out and inspect because I'm sure there's high standards of road paving and then there's... Are you talking about new, new roads or, or our existing streets? Stuff that we are going to take over. Take over. So I just, yes. I, I, I don't want to see a huge expense no. in, a, in the near future yeah. to the taxpayer for... Right. No, we certainly have a standard on any new roads. Doesn't, yeah, anything developed, we, we have a standard thickness. Um, and again, like I mentioned, typically you put down that first two and a half inches of a grade of asphalt over certain uh, grades of gravels to, to, uh, to be tested and compacted. Uh, put down that first two and a half inches, that's when we take the road over, when it's curbed and based paved, and we bond, they bond the rest, and we, we hold that as a performance bond, 120%, and then uh, they pave it you know, within the next two or three years. If, if they're not around, we take that money and pay, pay the top lift. Yeah. But uh, that's, you know, the standard is, is certainly clear and uh, industry standard of, of, we probably actually have, uh, we were one of the first towns I remember when I was in the other, on the other side, um, we had four inches of asphalt, which was most towns were putting down two and a half uh, or, or maybe three at most, and the roads were breaking up. Uh, they were putting down one lift. For a we, finished grade. For finished one one lift of, of less than three inches of asphalt, we put down two and a half and one and a half, one and a half usually again yeah. two or three years later uh, for a full four inch thickness of asphalt, yeah. and that's that's a for a local subdivision road um, is sort of above industry standard. Uh, when it comes to say the Hiltz Road, that'll have between five and six inches of asphalt mm -hmm. and, and no less than two lifts as well. So different different standards for different grades and classifications of roads based on you know truck volumes and things like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Director Bell, I just uh, had a question and it's more just to get an opinion from you. So there's been a lot of discussion, good discussion I think tonight around drainage. And, uh, and I said uh, earlier to Ms. Duncan that we follow the provincial regulation. But would it be something that the town of Kenful would ever consider looking into its own its own drainage. 
its own drainage program while keeping keeping in keeping and keeping <laughs> with the provincial regulation like just based on our own topography is that something that 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 towns do and that we potentially could look at down the road considering the Donny Hills connector and the fact that we have so much acreage of land to be developed absolutely absolutely Thank um, you. as as uh, as Kirsten mentioned in her in her uh, report, our subdivision bylaw is 2002. Is that right, Kirsten? So it's 20 plus 21 years old now, I guess. Um, needs some new language. Some um, you know, we looked at the town of Wolfville's. They've got some. They've had a report done uh, that addresses um, uh, from the subdivision stage um, drainage requirements, lot grading. We have you know we have language in ours that that uh, requires uh, a certain amount of of lot lot grading uh, plans to be submitted during development and certainly the, de the, the development itself uh, from a street perspective has to has to satisfy the the environment standard on on the net zero uh, any stormwater works that are installed now have to do that but you're right there's you know there's as Kirsten mentioned uh, you know you get into private onto private that's a civil matter but mm -hmm. we try to catch those things at the development stage sure. so that uh, you know you don't get into that uh, uh, run off from one from one property on, owner onto the other, so that's why you know that we do need some updated uh, language in our in our subdivision bylaw. But um, you know it's still it's there now. Just maybe bring it a little little uh, little update into the the next uh, decade. Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Bell? Lots of questions tonight. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Next on the agenda is uh, CAO Troke. You have two items there. Yes, thank you. So i uh, start off with uh, my usual uh, report. Uh, property assessed clean energy, uh, which is uh, acronym is PACE. Uh, Kenful specific program is being developed and uh, spoiler alert, it's called Kenful Switch, um, which will be coming forward for council's consideration. So there's two components to this. There's the program components and then the size of the program. So those are two elements that um, we're just working through some details both with regards to what is West Hands doing but also our colleagues at Pace Atlantic. On the engagement side, staff are completing an engagement process plan. So this is about creating a consistent approach for any new or emerging items that either council is looking for or staff is looking to uh, be involved in engagement. So it's kind of that comprehensive overarching look at this. Uh, renaming committee, so we've had lots of input from the public with regards to the street renaming and of course as per policy uh, we're going to need to uh, stand up that group who will be involved in that. So just a, a precursor to you'll be getting a note uh, from staff on that in the coming weeks. Uh, community grants, um, submissions were received, I think we had 15 applicants um, and three or four were brand new folks who have not applied before. Um, so once the budget is approved, that'll come back for council's consideration. And a number of job descriptions, these are new positions that are connected to the budget. The job descriptions have been completed, circulated um, with the directors and obviously with staff. And then for myself, we had our first Heritage Committee meeting recently and we've started our conversations with QP around a new collective agreement. Great. Are there any questions for the CAO? Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, when you mentioned PACE, it made me think, um, do we still pay for the power at the electric vehicle plug-in station at the rink? Do we still pay? Yes. So is there something we could do? Like, I, I understand the reasoning behind it, but unless we're going to give gas cards out to the rest of the people in Kenfield that are paying a buck 50 and a buck 60 and and stuff more a liter um, I think I think it's not fair what I right certainly happy to commit to council that we can kind of get a sense on what the usage has been and come back and give council a sense on what the cost of operating that is and then council can make a a decision if we want to treat it uh, consistently with the one here. So that one's been up and running for some time, so we should be able to at least get some data with regards to what are we seeing for, for usage. Thank you. No problem. Great. Councillor Maxwell. 
Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, CAO, um, the Kenful Switch program. Can you tell us a little bit more? Is it a heat pump program, like finan financing heat pumps uh, through through here, or because we're not going with pace, so you know we didn't. Yeah. Is uh, so, that what it is? Yeah. So what we're going to do is, so first of all, there's the energy component. So obviously you do a test of a house and what are the recommendations, but there's also within that an opportunity to do some of the other smaller things that might need to come along with that. So um, you may have efficient windows, but there might need to be some caulking cosmetic things that might need to happen with it. Um, so the components are, A, what are the types of things that obviously we would want to be pursuing so a heat pump could be one of them it could be um you know solar whatever whatever is coming back is that recommendation but council will be able to look at that package but then the second part to that is about how that financing would occur so um you know some cases municipal units look at financing themselves and the repayment comes to them other municipal units are going to credit unions or banks and the financing is going through through those organizations. So those are two pieces. We'll bring a package back and then council will be able to look at the, the, the puts and the takes on that. And then once that happens, then we can solidify what that would look like as a program and start that offering. Okay, thank you. And the grant process, what, what grant process are we gonna use this year? Because we did talk about, um, we didn't, I think the general consensus was we didn't really like the process we went through last year and we'd like to revert back to sitting down and discussing what what are what are we going to use so the latter is what the intention is um okay. and i think i think the big part is getting it done um as soon after the budget process as possible and okay. then then it's then it's completed and uh so that's our intention um and then if there's anything in it in that process that needs uh tweaking for any reason we can explore it at that time <laughs> okay and and did i miss it but was there a call put out for grants this year because I didn't I didn't see it it was through the newsletter and through our social media that was kind of how we pushed it out um, but um, yeah so that was that was the process that we used for getting information out and like I said we we did we, we had a number of groups who have applied and have applied in years gone by but we have I think it was three or maybe four new organizations who, who have applied as a result of that kind of information okay. all right thank you very much you're welcome thank you Councillor Huntley. Thank you. And it's just to uh, finish up the other question about community grants. I know it said we had 15 come in. What is the number of grants we offer? Is it 26? Or it used to be 26? Uh, you mean the dollar value? No, the number of grant, like community grants. Do we offer a certain amount? Uh, we basically based it on um, the pot of money available. <laughs> okay, <enough>. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Any other questions for the CAO? Seeing none, we will move on to the next item, CAO communications team, live streaming memo. Thank you very much. So uh, a memo was circulated to council with regards to communication. Um, and so the communications team, actually this is something that we've been chatting about for really some time. Um, and basically the change of the streaming protocols to increase accessibility and efficiency and align with what you're seeing most municipal units. So what staff is looking to do is to move to the YouTube platform beginning in April. So this will be for our council meeting on the 24th. The communications team considers the capacity, the audience, and how the most choose to interact and examine what platform worked best. This decision was really based on the resolution, streaming quality, and so on. And so unanimously staff were supportive of the idea of moving to this, especially after talking to some of their, their colleagues and other uh, municipal units. So the aim is for the communications team to improve our protocols and practices so we can engage in the best ways with our audience while sticking to the principles around creating meaningful, safe and inclusive online spaces. On the back of the note, and you'll notice a little appendix, that right now there are 26 municipal units are live streaming, streaming their meetings, 17 are not. Um, of those who are live streaming, nine are using Facebook, but 18 have moved to the YouTube platform. And, um, and then there's actually a few who are using um, alternative platforms to that, and some are actually streaming with audio only, not with video. 
So the intention is for the town to move to the YouTube platform for our April 24th meeting. Now the link is still gonna be available on Facebook for folks to be able to, to connect to uh, YouTube. The YouTube uh, video will be available obviously live, but also afterwards for folks. And the ability for anybody who wants to be able to drop comments to, to Facebook, and obviously we encourage people to come directly to your counselor if you have something that you would like to comment on. Um, so really this is about the platform itself moving from Facebook to uh, YouTube for a, a host of reasons and it seems to be very consistent with what most municipal units are doing. Great, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for the CAO with regards to uh, the new live streaming? Councillor York. Yep. Sure. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the work that goes into this from the communications team. Uh, I assume, with no offense to the CEO, of course, that they are probably much more knowledgeable in the world of social media than perhaps you <laughs> may that be, is sir. Correct. Um, but I do appreciate that uh, YouTube is a much more accessible uh, platform for our uh, residents. It doesn't require having an account. It doesn't require you to do all those other things, but it is also much more accessible in terms of um, like uh, closed captioning. It's much more accurate and it makes for a much more inclusive uh, experience for those who are in our community and who are interacting with our community. And as we move forward with things like the Kenfield Inclusion and Access Committee, I think those recommendations are important to look at when we, when we look at all of the um, committees and all of the things that we're doing as a town, we should really be trying to incorporate all of those lenses that we've already deemed as being important and also um, we're putting as a top tier priority. Um, so I do appreciate the work that goes into this and I appreciate the other municipal units who are obviously ahead of the uh, curve here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Sabian. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Just wondering, and I'm not tech savvy at all, um, can the YouTube link be shared to Facebook? And then you kind of have the best of both worlds, is that? I believe that's the intent, is that you, through Facebook, can click on the link that will take you there, I believe is how it was set up. Uh, but again, uh, I can ask the question and verify how that's gonna work. Yeah, even if you, if you could ask through the, through the, if you could ask the CEO if there's a way that it could be streamed at the same time. The, that uh, I don't know. I don't think it's gonna be streamed simultaneously. It will only be streamed through YouTube. So the link to get you to YouTube would be there on Facebook, but we won't be streaming on Facebook. Okay. Thank you. So, so, and I'm not as tech savvy, say, as Councillor York and some others that around here. But um, so, if it's if it's on YouTube, then the YouTube video would uh, would be um, uploaded to the Town of Kempville Facebook. It, so no. you no, you'd be able okay. to click on a link that would take you to it. Okay. So so you could still go in through Facebook, click on the link, and that'll take you to it or so you can access it at any point in time. Okay. The intention is YouTube is anybody, even if you don't have a Facebook account, right. you can click on it and watch the meeting. So it's, it's just about straight efficiency for folks who want to partake and don't want to sign up for anything and see what's going on. Okay, I understand, thank you for the clarification. Councilor Maxwell. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know who to, to address this question to, but uh, one of our tech people could maybe answer it. Um, one of the drawbacks of Facebook was on Facebook if I decided to watch the meeting, a little thing would come up and give my name and say, so-and-so is, wa is watching along with you, which a lot of people do not like. And uh, I'm wondering, is that turned off on YouTube? Like, can people just go on and watch without their names going up? Yes? Okay, thank you. Okay. I'm glad we have some techie people here. <laughs> thank you. Okay, are there any other questions around that issue? None. Hearing none, we'll move forward. And uh, next on the agenda item is agenda. Sorry, I keep saying agenda item. Uh, business arising from the minutes and old business. Thank you, staff. Appreciate oh, it. Thank you, staff. Sorry. Thank you for all your hard work tonight. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. So uh, under new business, uh, mm -hmm. we have a report mm -hmm. from the Physician Naviga Community Navigation. This is an annual report. This is F FYI for council. Information came through. We wanted to make sure that everybody had access to um, that information. Okay. And the next item was the Heritage Committee Council appointment. 
Yeah, so we have two pieces here. Maybe I'm in a sequence. This is my, my apology. I That's jumped right. ahead. So okay. um, so we have two pieces. Committee of Council Policy Revision and Heritage Committee Council Report. So yes. I, I jumped on to nine. My apology. That's okay. Um, so first of all, with regards to policy statement G57 Committees of Council, so there's a little bit of, of background work here that needed to be done. And so this was last revised in 2019. And so, first of all, um, I recognize that the Student Bursary Selection Committee has been ongoing and functioning, but it wasn't actually referenced in our uh, committees of council. So, just to formalize, to make sure that that is part of the committees of council. Included, we now have our Heritage Committee meeting, which was formed here in 2023, so that needs to be reflective in the policy. And while council needs to have a, a greater conversation around the Planning and Advisory Committee, that the intention would be is that if council is moving ahead with that, then that would need to be put into this as well. So basically there's a number of recommendations here, which is at this point for council's information. One, the consideration of adding the student bursary selection committee. And we put some background here for council's consideration or around discussion. The heritage committee itself, which uh, has now stood up and also the consideration of going down the road of a planning advisory committee. So these are three pieces of, of housekeeping that we would like council to review. Obviously, there's a greater discussion needs to happen around the planning advisory committee, but we wanted to make sure this was on council's radar screen so that when council meets, uh, discussion could occur around uh, these items, what they wanted included, and perhaps even with regards to the planning advisory committee, if there's a dis larger discussion that council would like to have around that. So this is a piece of, of, of work that I really appreciate. The deputy clerk is continuing to um, move forward and we wanted this to be on council's radar screen so they could consider this as a potential change to policy G57 committees of council. Thank you, CAO. Uh, so coming out of that, uh, there is a recommendation there um, so I will read the recommendation, and then if somebody so wishes to um, motion it and second it, and then we can go for discussions. So the recommendation is that Council review and approve the attached revisions to Policy Statement G57, Committees of Council, to include sections on the Heritage Committee, Student Bursary Committee, and Planning Advisory Committee. Is there somebody that would like to move that? Councillor Huntley? <clears throat> Do I have a seconder? Right. Councillor Gerard, seconder, and we will uh, open it up for discussion. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Um, I really would like to um, see these divided into separate things rather than packaged together um, for a vote. And uh, I want to speak to the Student Bursary Selection Committee. I don't think that I feel that it's not right to include this, uh, this committee with the same parameters as all other student, or uh, as all other committees of council. And the reason I don't think it's right to do that is because this committee meets uh, once as a group. And there are only three people on the committee. And so naming one as a chair, one as a vice chair, and then somebody as a secretary um, it, it seems a little bit redundant to me. Um, as secretary for this type of committee, um, I, you know, I have grave concerns about that because you're talking about students' personal information. You're talking about their financial backgrounds with their families. You're talking about their uh, record of marks, their transcripts, and everything else. So really, the only thing that should come out of that committee is who was, who was selected. And, uh, and then putting uh, uh, parameters around how many times they could be s serving. Right now we have um, two ladies that have been on that committee, one of them for 11 years, one for nine years. They, they do that service once every year. That's what they do for the town. They have never received a penny of remuneration. They have maybe picked up a, a thank you from a, like a t-shirt or a hat uh, during COVID, I personally bought them uh, Tim Hortons uh, gift cards. Um, I, I think that, you know, we're asking citizens to, to give their time to go through the different 
um, transcripts and so on, it would be about, and I've gone through them myself, two to three hours, at least two nights, to go through all of those uh, transcripts uh, to make notes. And then you come in and we sit down and we discuss them. Uh, everybody on that committee is a retired teacher. And, and I really feel like, you know, to, to tell those members after all, you know, for that service, um, that, okay, you're done because you've been on for this length of time, is, is really doing a disservice. And I did run this by the members and honestly, <laughs> they felt it was a condemnation of the time that they have given and that, that what they were doing was not adequate enough. It was not good enough. And, uh, and that's how they feel. And uh, so I would really like to see, I don't know, it's not an ad hoc committee, I guess, it's, it's, uh, but it certainly doesn't fit into the parameters around a committee of council to make it fit with everything else. It's kind of like taking a, a round peg and sticking, trying to stick it in a square hole. It just, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem to work for me. And uh, so I think we should take a look at that again before we bring it forward. I, I would at least like to see that one separated off and, uh, and staff to take another look at that and uh, listen to what I've said about, about uh, how that committee operates and maybe we can look at some other set up. I chair it, so you know, having a chair I guess is fine, and, and I pass in the, the notes to, uh, to, to Jennifer, and, and the mayor is usually the one who goes to the graduation and, uh, and presents. Um, I would like to see something around that if the mayor can't go, that at least somebody goes, because last year nobody went, and uh, those, those awards were not presented during graduation ceremonies last year, and, uh, and one of them is the Nola Folker Hill uh, memorial uh, scholarship bursary, and uh, and I really think we should be doing a, a proper service to that. So, okay. 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 Thank you, Councillor Maxwell. You. Um, is there any uh, further discussion? I don't see any other. Oh, sorry, I do. Councillor Huntley, go ahead. Sorry, that's okay. Um, no in listening to Councillor Maxwell. Um, she, you know, reminded me about what the bursaries are really about, and um, I've had my own personal bursary committee, which is me, myself, and I, for about seven years now. But when you're reading those letters, it's about passion, and they're so personal that sometimes you cry when you read them. And I do agree with uh, Councillor Maxwell. I think they need to be treated as something really special, and uh, that's all I have to say, so thank you. So, I mean, maybe what we could look to do is um, amend uh, that motion. Um, could, go ahead, CEO. So the amendment would just that each of these items would come back individually for consideration. So it's essentially the same motion, only it will be item one, item two, item three, for council vote on them separately to be added, consideration to be added to the Heritage Committee, or to be added to the committee's policy. Right. Okay. And I probably completely messed Jennifer up, so. <laughs> I'm trying to understand it as well. <laughs> so. Maybe Jennifer, when you're ready, you can read the motion. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maxwell, for the different perspective. It helps. So I would recommend that the first motion read that Council review and approve the attached revisions to the policy statement G57 to include sections on the, a section on the Heritage Committee. So that, that would be the first motion to discuss. Thank you. Could I have somebody motion that? Okay, Councillor Maxwell, second. Councillor York. Any further discussion? Okay, ready for the question. Let's wait for the vote. That's okay. No rush. Do 
meeting is now open. Voting is now closed and the motion is carried. Okay. Did you want to take the second motion, Deputy Clerk? Second motion would be that council review and approve the attached revisions to policy statement G57 to include a section on the student bursary committee. Second. Any discussion? Councillor Maxwell. So does that mean it will come back looking different when we see it again? considering what I've said to you, or are we just gonna stick with exactly what's here? Well, as, as this reads, basically mm -hmm. we're saying that at committee, it's being recommended to go to council and that it would be its own separate item. Um, I don't know if we're explicitly saying in this, it would stick to what is here, that we're saying that we're recommending that the heritage, or that we'd be recommended that the student bursary committee be considered under policy G57. But I'm saying it doesn't fit with policy G57. That's what I'm saying. So then the vote is is yes, it goes to G57. No, it doesn't. It doesn't go. Okay. And presumably, if it didn't go to G57, then something else could be brought back. Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. Call for the question. Voting is now open. Can you repeat the question just one more time so I can hear it again? Sorry. Mm -hmm. review and approve and approve the attached revisions sorry. the council review and approve the attached revisions to policy statement G57 to include a section on the student bursary committee mm -hmm. so you're approving That's what I wanted yep. to say. yes <laughs> voting is now open <clears throat> Voting is now closed and the motion is defeated. Okay, thank you. And the third motion, Deputy Clerk. that council review and approve the attached revisions to policy statement G57 to include a section on the planning advisory committee. Okay, I have somebody motion. Councillor Huntley, Councillor Gerard for the second. Any discussion around the motion? Hearing none, the question's been called. Voting is now open. Voting is now closed and the motion is carried. Great, thank you very much. So next item is the Heritage Committee Council appointment. So the uh, first meeting of the Heritage Committee occurred. Councillor uh, Zabian is the chair of this committee and we need one more member of council to sit, so there is currently a vacancy on this committee and council must consider 
uh, appointing an elected official to this group. So staff recommends the council discuss and appoint a member to sit on the Heritage Committee. Thank you, CEO. Um, I will open it up to people around the council table to discuss this. Is there anybody that would like to put their name forward? I can do it formally, nominations from the floor and say it three times, but Councillor Maxwell, I see your light on, but I think that's from before. Mm -hmm. It is? Okay. Councillor York. Thank you. Wondering uh, through the chair if the chair of that committee could give us a sense of the um, time commitment and what that's looking like, just because we weren't, it's been developed and we weren't there. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, through the chair, it's, um, we've only met once, and it was, ba I think, maybe like 35 minutes. Um, we're going to meet again in a month just to kind of, we haven't really established anything yet. So right now I think it's monthly until we um, see how we go forward, I guess, on that. So, and it would, the lot, it's um, four o'clock on a Monday, I think. Am I right, Jasper? Yeah. Okay. Councillor Gerard. Yeah, uh, I'll put my name forward. I, I think I'd be interested in that committee. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, Councillor Maxwell? Yeah. I could reconsider. <laughs> okay, I was going to ask that question, but I did not want to push. Um, would you, you, are you prepared to reconsider? Yeah, I'll reconsider. Okay. So uh, we can have a vote. Well, we, we, <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Gerard, would you like your name still to stand? Okay, then we are going to have a vote. And I believe the vote is done using the ballots and, uh, and uh, the CAO and the dep deputy clerk will um, tally the votes once they're passed out. As a result of the vote, uh, Councillor Maxwell has been appointed to the Heritage Committee. If committee would move that forward for Council's consideration in two weeks. Okay, that would be great. So if I, I could have somebody motion that. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Zeeding. Councillor Huntley, second. And 
that uh, any discussion? Hearing none, the question has been called. If we could vote on that. And as we noted, this is the recommendation going to council. Correct. Thank you. Voting is now open. And voting is now closed. And the uh, motion is carried. Congratulations, Councillor Maxwell. All right, next item on the agenda is correspondence. I believe there were. I do not have any correspondence for committee. Okay. Um, under new business, there is the physician community navigation annual report. So uh, just to uh, go back to when I jumped again the last time, we have the <laughs> physician community navigation annual report. Information was made available for council, so I present present that to council for information purposes. Wonderful, thank you. And Councillor Huntley, you are the, uh, that is one of your committees of council. Did you want to speak to that at all? No. Sorry, we just had one meeting, meeting so far. Go ahead, yeah. And um, everything that's pretty much in this report is, is what we've talked about. However, um, what we are looking for now is there will probably be another subcommittee uh, to try and help the navigator with the amount of projects that are coming up, so I know Brianna's working on that right now. Okay, great, thank you very much. Next item is the Kentville Volunteer Fire uh, Service area rate. So uh, where Kentville sets a fire service area rate to fund the services for the Kentville Volunteer Fire Department, uh, a meeting was held where a budget, uh, the application request for a total of 271,600 from taxation and 6,600 from grants in lieu. Uh, an area rate is requested of 0 0.0397 per 100 as an assessed value as the rate. Now this compares to last year's rate of 0 0.0378. So as part of um, the process council uh, receives this request from the Kedful Volunteer Fire Department or Committee of Council, and um, must make a recommendation to council if they accept the rate. Thank you. So if we put that into a motion, um, say that it would be that council um, accept the Area rate. Requested area rate the requested. for the Kenful Volunteer Fire Department. Okay. So the motion would be that Kenful accept the area rate uh, requested by the Kenful Volunteer Fire Department. Correct. Could I have somebody move that? Thank you, Councillor Gerard, Councillor Huntley. Uh, any discussion? No discussion. So the question has been called. It's CAC's recommending to council. I'm sure the deputy clerk recorded it that way, but. Yes. So let's, if you would repeat the motion then, deputy clerk. That, count, that council advisory committee recommend to the April 24th, 2023 meeting of council that council approve, sorry, that council accept the requested area rate for the Kenfield Volunteer Fire Department. Perfect. Thank you. And thank you, solicitor. Voting is now open. And the voting is now closed and the motion is carried. Next item under new business is the request for decision and it is titled amenity space and Councillor Zabian, you brought that forward. So would you like to speak to that? Sure, thank you, Deputy Mayor. You're welcome. Um, I'd like council to review uh, 4.1.3 in the land use bylaw. 
and propose that we have an amendment to that. Um, like everywhere else, we're experiencing a housing shortage and I forgot to attach it, but um, 4.1.3 in the land use bylaw states that all new multi-unit development containing four or more dwellings shall provide an on-site amenity space. Um, this would work fine with newer buildings or buildings with property with land. However, many of the buildings in our downtown core are older, um, do not have any land with them. So if a landlord wanted to add more than three residential units to a building downtown and didn't have the land, they would have to sacrifice between 200 and 255 uh, square feet per unit to use as an amenity space. So another example, if a developer wanted to construct five residential units, five uh, one-bedroom units, they would have to give up a thousand square feet of space to accommodate this bylaw. So this would mean that you could lose two or three extra residential units by giving up this space. With this housing, housing crisis, um, I don't think we should turn developers away. We know that our downtown is considerably quiet after 5 p.m. and it would be great to see more activity down there in the evenings and more people living down there. So this prospect um, of making this change would may obviously make the downtown feel a little safer, more inviting, and uh, we'd be helping the housing shortage. So that's what I want to say on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. I guess, sorry. Oh, um, no, just one second. Yeah. Go, go ahead. I for, yeah, I just, I guess staff could review it, but I mean to review possibly maybe making that rule um, not exist with the older buildings downtown, I guess, or not applicable to the, to the not applicable to the buildings in the downtown core. Thank you. Okay, thank you. CAO, did you wish to speak to this? Uh, uh, so, Councillor stole the words right out of my mouth. I think the, uh, we'll bring this to planning, have a review on it, and then that can come back for a full discussion at Council. Okay, and with that, um, if that is a change in our municipal planning strategy, then that would have to go to first reading, second reading, and public consultation. Right, so this will come back to committee and council as a report, just as you saw Ms. Duncan do tonight with okay. kind of an overview on the, uh, the uh, overall uh, thoughts and processes around that. Okay, great, thank you very much. Councillor Zabian, you're fine with that. Did you want to say anything else? No, that's great. Oh, okay, great, thank you. I see the solicitor does, though. Deputy Mayor, just from a process perspective, I yes. think it would be useful to have a motion to refer to staff for a report, and then you have a record of it, and it will show up in, in a work plan later. Um, just, to, just to expand on what staff have to do, they need to take that and evaluate your municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw, and not only give you a planning opinion, but tell you what needs to be changed to accommodate it, because um, although it's obvious that the land use bylaw may need to, uh, that the land use bylaw may need to be changed to accommodate it, it may also require a municipal planning strategy amendment, and uh, and so that's why you have to rely on your staff, planning staff, and and so if you have a planner, or, or uh, those that you have need to evaluate that and then report back to council. Okay. And so if if you had a motion to refer it to staff to uh, prepare a report presumably to come back to CAC if the and ideally in that motion you'd have a time frame so if that's six months three months or whatever so that staff know what they're working with and know where it falls in their priorities okay thank you very much so then before the motion um, is made um, what would you suspect that time frame would look like well, I would, I would say that um, more than likely, um, considering the current work that's going on with the rezoning application, and uh, I know that Ms. Duncan has described about another other, a number of developments that are sitting before now, um, I think bringing this back in a three-month period would be likely, and if there was any catch-up on that, I would bring that back to Council to, to consider. But I, I think if we said three months, that would be reasonable. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please, thank you. That council, sorry, uh, that council advisory committee recommend to the April 24th, 2023 meeting of council, that council direct the CAO to review the land use bylaw on the matter of amenity space in section 4.1.3 in the land use bylaw, and that a staff report come back to council at the July council advisory committee meeting. Okay, thank you. Could I have somebody move that? Councillor Huntley, second? Councillor Maxwell, any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the question.
Voting is now open. And voting is now closed. And the motion is carried. Thank you. Okay. So next item on the agenda is another request for decision uh, with respect to Kentville Recreation Complex. And Councillor Zabian, that is one you brought forward. Yeah. So I'm going to assume you wish to speak to it. All right. Thank you again, Deputy Mayor. Um, for the last two years, Kentville has been uh, part of the Regional Recreation uh, Facility Feasibility Study, partnering with the County of Kings of Moorful. Um, if this project ever becomes a reality, and I mean, I certainly hope we see it become a reality, but it's going to be years away, and most probably this, pro this uh, proposed complex will not be located in Kentville. So we, could, we will be investing millions and millions of dollars into a facility that will not be in Kentville. Meanwhile, we do have older facilities here in our... Um, Director of uh, Recreation um, is going to come back with a report on, on kind of the status of those facilities. I, um, I think it's time, I guess, for Kenful, I guess, for us to kind of look at seeing if we should be doing something on our own. Perhaps we should invest the money in our town here. What that facility or complex looks like, I don't know, but I think it might be time to engage in a conversation to see what we can do, um, even as a council, to, to kind of push that forward because we've spent two years now working with, with Wolfville and with, with Kings County, and who knows what that's gonna look like if it's even gonna come to, to light. So maybe we should be a little more ambitious as a group here and, and try to work together on um, on what we can do. And I'm, I'm biased, I like to focus in Kentville, so I'd like to have a discussion on that and see what we can do as a group. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And CEO, did you wish to speak before I open it up to the floor? Uh, I just think one of the things I was going to say was um, that Director Benningfield's staff, I believe in next CAC, are going to bring back a, kind of a, a facilities condition piece. So I think that it might be once that's received by council, council uh, committee of council, it might be then appropriate to receive direction after receiving that. So if, if this as an RFD were tabled until you get that report and then council can give direction from there, if that would make sense. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Maxwell. Thank you. Yes, um, I was just gonna echo what uh, CAO said. Um, we, should, we should definitely wait until we get a report back on, on our facilities. Um, I, think we need, I think we need to keep in mind that these facilities are not cheap. And uh, you know whether it's building a new rink or whether it, you know, or it's a gym or it's a, a pool, um, and the biggest I think need that was uh, in the needs assessment was the people in this area want an indoor pool, before anything else. That's what they want, and uh, and, and uh, so I think we definitely need to have um, that report on our facilities first, and uh, I'd be willing to to put a motion to table this until until such time as we get a report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gerard. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I totally agree with, uh, with Councillor Zabian. I think, I think it's time for us as a council to decide what we wanna do. Um, I think even if we don't decide what we wanna do, we have to ask a lot of questions on price, what we want to, 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 to have built. Um, and where it's going to go, and and you know if if everybody else is is different than we are, then you know uh, it's a democracy. So whatever council votes, but I think I think before we start spending staff time and taxpayers' money, um, this council has to decide what direction they want to go uh, in in uh, in regards to the to the feasibility study, and make sure that we don't waste anybody's time or money. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor York. Thank you. Um, to Councillor Zabian's point and to, and to Councillor Maxwell's point, um, this is going to take time. This, this project, however it moves forward, will take time. In that time, I think we should, to Councillor Maxwell's point, get those reports and see what we're working with with our own facilities because we will have to do something um, likely regardless of where we're wherever we are in this process we will have to do something to our existing facilities mm -hmm. and it's going to be best to know to get a report on where all of those faci facilities are because we're going to have to make a decision at some point but regardless if we move forward as a as a whole um, with our other municipal partners or if we 
opt to go it alone, we still need to have that information because we will have to at some point inject cash into some of these facilities and it would be best to make a decision with all of the information at hand. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? So if I'm, oh, so Councillor Huntley. <laughs> Slow on the draw, sorry. That's okay, you go no, right ahead. I it's just okay. want to say this is a good RFD, mm -hmm. Councillor Zavian, and um, I think it's, it's time. Um, and I'm also interested in, to hear what the public is starting to think now because mm -hmm. I think a lot of us are all on the same page, and, mm -hmm. but money is obviously a big, a big factor here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Councillor Maxwell. Yeah, uh, just one more, one more point is the reason that we haven't, I think, over the years been able to, to get a recreation facility built is because it, the cost is exorbitant. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, in this, these areas of Kings County, which is what we're looking at, uh, we've had a problem with doing things in silos. It has to be in Kenful, it's gotta be done by Kenful, it has to be in Wolfville, it's gotta be done by Wolfville, it has to be in Kings County, it's gotta be done by Kings County. And that's why we've been spinning our wheels forever. And I think in, in a project of this size, and this, you know, that we are going to have to play the give and take game. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, you're, you're looking at putting money, we may be looking at putting money into a facility that is well below what the, the community and, and the area is expecting. And so I just want us to keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm not sure that we need a motion on this. I think we're comfortable just if you're okay just yes. th that we will table it and with the understanding that the facilities conditions piece comes back from director Bettingfield and then we move from there okay thank you for that and the next item is a request for warranty deed amendment CAO thank you so um, many folks uh, are aware of indoor air solutions um, uh, purchased a piece of property from the town and the original intent was to start construction on the first phase of kind of a two-phase development with the building being a 25 by 30 uh, building with a small office washroom and basically um, storage facility so this is PID 555-44308 which is on Chipman Road in the park um, so in discussions with Mr. Denier over the last number of months, um, obviously with uh, costs um, escalating, he has made a request if the building could be reduced in size, so the phase one of this building, from 25 by 30 to 18 by 28. Um, he's not looking for an extension of the timeline. Um, basically, he is prepared to start clearing the lot immediately with the intention that modular a modular um, unit would be placed on the site and allow him to commence working from uh, there immediately. So the request is not about any changes to the original timeline uh, or um, other conditions. It's simply that the building of, well, the phase one of the building to get up and running would be reduced in size from 25 to by 30 to 18 by 28. So the request would be the council approve uh, or council approve the consideration of a reduction in size of the building for indoor air solutions on lot PID 555-44308. Thank you, CAO. So that would be that CAC recommend to council you do such a great job, Deputy Clerk. Do you want to? <laughs> I actually, I'm going to pass it back to CEO. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so the consideration the, of the reduction in size. Consideration of the reduction in size, um, uh, uh, the reduction in size from the original concept of 25 by 30. Well, actually, reduction in size um, as outlined in the request from uh, Indoor Air Solutions. Deputy Clerk, can you read that? Yep. 
that Council Advisory Committee recommend to the April 24th meeting of Council that Council approve the consideration in the reduction in size as outlined in the request from Indoor Air Solutions. Could I have somebody motion that? Councillor Gerard? Second? Councillor Huntley? Any discussion? So we'll call the question. I see the solicitor. Okay. Just wanted to make it clear, because I'm not sure the CEO said this, I believe he's also asking for a reduction in the amount of paved parking area. Yes, a smaller building with smaller paving, correct. So the change as it wind in the request. So smaller building, smaller uh, paved area. You want to hear that again? The council approve the consideration in the reduction in building size and pavement area size as outlined in the request from Indoor Air Solutions. Okay, thank you. Voting is now open. And voting is now closed and the motion is carried. And next, we are to the public comment, comment section. So members of the public are invited to speak to council on any agenda item. And uh, if there's anybody here that would like to speak, would you please come up and state your name and address? I see somebody coming up. Wonderful. <laughs> Good evening, council, staff. Uh, my name is Brent O'Connor. I live at 18 Orchard Road, right up here. Um, I a couple points from the meeting tonight I wanted to, to bring back to you to think about further as we go forward. Um, in the development discussion around the McDougal Heights subdivision, um, I, I noted in IM7, paragraph C talks about utilities. And as we move forward in a more dense society, the, the idea being that utilities are part of the consideration that town planning staff would put together and pay attention to as they do that. And as we move forward in a more dense society, uh, it seems to me that transit is a utility. Transit is a universal service that's provided so that people can have access to it. And it was interesting uh, to, to not hear discussions around provisions for transit in that. We had discussions about how much pavement we require developers put on roads before we take it over. We have requirements about how much space we require among from developers to put out for green space. We even had discussions here at council tonight about amenity space and whether or not that's required and how much we force developers to do that. We even have and have recently had council had discussions about how much money we charge developers and businesses if they don't have enough parking spaces in the commercial zone. It only seems to make sense that council would also consider as they move forward and as we look at the fact that in a 10 year time frame we're going to have 50% more people in this town if you look at a 3% growth rate that we start considering making developers pay for the cost of transit infrastructure, that being how it affects the roads, where people stop to wait for the bus, how they get around, are the roads the right size. Even when they build the buildings, can transit get in around and do the things they need to do? Another comment I wanted to bring up was the discussion around invasive species. Um, the woolly agent is not the only invasive species in the town of Kentville. Japanese knotweed is invasive and is moving everywhere fast. It is choking out many of our urban waterways. You only need to go up here to the top of this street to see it build up. You come to my backyard where the town's land backs onto it. We need to be paying more attention to invasive species as we go forward. And lastly, the spike fund. We talked tonight about um, how much time and effort, and we have a specific bylaw dedicated to making sure that we get the right people in the right place to give the right bursaries to the right kids. It's surprising to me that there's no financial contribution other than staff time and effort to the spike fund from the town of Kentville. Um, it would seem that given that recreation is community wellness, not just sports facilities that we would like to spend millions of dollars on, maybe we could come up with a scheme such as matching donations up to a certain amount within the actual fiscal budget so that people of need can actually get access to rec programs that the town of Kentville offers um, instead of having to beg, borrow, and steal. Instead of the town of Kentville 
rec staff having to work out special deals with people who want to put on events to see if they can somehow raise a little bit of money for the spike fund. Mm -hmm. The rec department's doing their best. It's time for council to do their best and make sure that the spike fund is funded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Is there anyone else from the public? Jennifer Curry, as I'm sure many of you know, I live on Acadia by now. <laughs> um, I just wanted to speak to the stormwater issue again. Um, so Dave Bell spoke about pictures that were sent the other day of the Acadia and Mount Vincent section. He spoke positively about the water pooling where it is and that some of the pooling was because of leaves and debris. Um, so first of all, I'm wondering, those leaves and debris, should those not be cleared? And who's responsible for clearing those while the development is happening? If we're talking about 10 years of development, then we need to make sure that flooding is not made worse by leaves and debris. Um, second, that the plot of houses on, Main, on Mount Vincent is a different development that was mentioned. However, it sits below the proposed development. So once the land is cleared um, about where the proposed development is, uh, where will that water be going? it's going to be coming downhill into the Mount Vincent down to Acadia. Um, this has been a recurring concern from residents and has been brought up several times by councillors. And thank you, each of you, for spending so much time looking into this. We do appreciate it. Uh, one major concern from looking at the new document is that there, if there are flooding issues once buildings are completed and the property is sold, that the issue would be between two private property owners. So what it's saying is, once it's sold, not our problem. It's not the town's problem, and it's not the developer's problem, which goes back to what many residents have said, that they have been complaining and they're told, go talk to the developer, or say, go talk, they say, go talk to the town. So what that, the DNC section, I believe, is where it is, um, they say that it's actually between the two property owners. So that means it will be the residents, current and future residents' problem, which is a pretty big concern as Flooding issues can cost a lot of money, obviously. Um, yes, that was for that portion. The, the school portion for the AVRCE, um, I, my question for them would be, are they talking about the number of bodies that they can, oh, sorry, that they can house in the building that they can accommodate or actual accommodations for those students as well? As it stands, many students aren't getting the supports that are needed, and my opinion is very subjective. I do acknowledge that, um, but I have a child who has significant learning needs, no behavioral needs, and he was, we were always told he would not qualify for an aid in the classroom because he does not have behavioral or medical needs. So for his educational needs, um, he had maxed out at 30 minutes being pulled out a day, maybe. Um, so he does not have, he did not, we've now pulled him out and he goes to Landmark, but he did not have access to the supports he should have due to funding and staffing issues. And this has been, he's in grade five, so it's been six years now. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just how many kids you can fit in a building, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you very much. Hi. I was not planning on speaking tonight, and I have incredibly sweaty palms right now, but there are a few things I've jotted down that I just feel I want to speak to. So Megan Sabian, and I will acknowledge that I do live in McDougall Heights, so I have a bias, <laughs> um, but I do want to share a couple of thoughts with you guys tonight after seeing the presentation. And I also didn't have enough time today to digest all of that, <laughs> um, so I will be spending some time as well going through that in more detail, and appreciate that you guys will be too. So. Um, CA Choke did mention that somebody reached out for the full traffic study. It was me, and I encourage everybody to get their hands on that and try to read through it. It is very detailed, and you know, like I don't come from that area, but going through it, you know, helped me understand better how that study was completed, and you can sort of read into or better understand some of the limitations within that, which I think is important to acknowledge. Um, so I just want to raise a couple of those. The one immediate recommendation that, it, that they did come forward with was to construct a left turning lane onto Acadia Drive from Park Street, um, which does not exist right now, but if you look at Duncan and Palmeter, the other two entrances to McDougall Heights, they have them. Mm -hmm. 
recognizing that Acadia is, of course, newer, and that was not put in at the time, but given the size of Acadia, it should have been. So that recommendation is not even contingent on this proposal going forward. It should be done now. So my question to council would be, have we started looking at what that cost would be, time frame for that, and is it going to be done? Because it isn't even contingent on this proposal going forward. Um, like I said, it did come with its limitations, so some of them were outlined up front, and I appreciate that. Um, it was limited to traffic counts only and movement solely at the entrances off of Park Street, so Palmeter, Duncan, and Acadia. It did not consider traffic flow within the subdivision itself and all of its side streets. Myself, I live up on McDonald Park Road, which is at the top, so, you know, Carlton Drive, one of the proposed would be coming off of our street, did not consider all of the flow up in there. This is kind of unfortunate because we saw on the map tonight that it does propose, I think, f up to five new additional entrances, one of which would be Donald E. Hill, so that probably doesn't need to be considered, but four new entrances to the proposed development all coming off of existing roads within the subdivision, and those are within one to two kilometers from Acadia and Park Street intersection. So we've studied that entrance down here, but it's one to two kilometers away from all the traffic flow and pedestrian flow and cycle flow way up there. So we haven't even looked at that from that study lens. Um, the, he did reference in the study um, that they, they did expect to see more children playing in the streets, probably likely due to the amount of feedback from residents. Um, but it was a little bit short-sighted given that it was, I think, a Tuesday and a Wednesday and kids were in school. And again, it was done at the intersections only, not where there's houses within the subdivision. There are not many, maybe two or three houses directly at those intersections, and they are not family dwellings. Um, finally, if you look at the detailed scenarios in the study, and please don't quote me on this. Again, please read into it for yourselves. This is just my interpretation, so I recognize my limits there. Um, you'll see that based on the different proposal, proposed um, scenarios and the level of service um, within those scenarios for development, it would actually be noted that given those scenarios, the level of service would actually go down once complete, so during construction and once completed if this proposal moves forward. And currently right now it meets the minimum. That's the minimum we're just meeting right now. So I'd just like to consider what potentially council could consider to maybe mitigate some of that if that proposal were to go forward. And then, I'm not timing myself, so please kick me off <laughs> over time here. No, just ahead. digging in a little bit into that report, or the consultant report from CND, and thank you so much for taking the initiative to, to, to get into that um, and provide that to us. They also did pick up on the traffic study and said that it doesn't meet the requirements of the land use bylaw and the MPS currently uh, to ensure safe movement of pedestrians and cyclists. We've identified that's a limitation of the traffic study. Um, it does reference short-sightedness of current town policies, which requires adjusting to allow the town to make better and more informed planning, sort of that whole town planning picture, not one-off developments, and we've talked a lot about that tonight with the MPS and sort of the secondary planning and, and what that looks like, but currently our MPS and our, our land use bylaws refer back and forth to each other without either one really providing for much direction or clear direction to guide proper planning and decision making. Um, it was also discuss discussed tonight related to the school space needed to meet the needs of this proposed development and suggested that completion of the Donald E. Hiltz along the top there, the connector road, uh, would open up access to adjacent R5 lots along Park Street, so large lots of lands for future development. I'm just wondering what council may want to consider here is that the current MPS doesn't contain any policy to say what those densities are just like it doesn't say what that density should be for this proposed development. So it is limited in that capacity. And what the minimum public and active transportation requirements would be, what the infrastructure planning would be needed to meet some of those bare minimums. And f pushing this current development through would only, I shouldn't say that absolute, but may encourage another one-off development that requires the developer to only meet the minimum of what is required currently per policy. Um, versus whole town, big picture planning. Um, if we know we're going to develop those adjacent lands, if we're talking about that now, why aren't we considering that in a whole picture planning so that this developer is not just putting in the bare minimum requirements of stormwater management, those pipes, to meet his development, but also 
feeding into the next piece of land that's gonna be developed for that school that may be set aside in 10 years to meet the, the, the capacity that's going to be needed. So just thinking about that in a more whole picture planning way, um, I think would be beneficial immensely to this town. And I'll just leave that with council. Thanks. Thank you very much. Are there any other public comments? Oh. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? Because not everybody can be heard when they're at this mic. Yes. I have a voice similar to Councillor Huntley's. We seem to project without even trying. Okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, so I live in 12 Condon. Um, my concern and, and your with name the... Is? Sorry. Your name is? Oh, I'm sorry. Bunny Bennett. Okay, I thought I you. said that. Bunny no. Bennett, okay. 12 Condon Avenue. Um, my concern with the proposed Bryson development and I'm not against development. I think downtown retail development, subdivision development is vital for our town to go forward. My concern, and I live on Condon, so you th I think you all know where I'm going with this. We had bad flooding on our street. Our street was destroyed. A councillor, Gerard, you are aware of that very well because one of your apartment buildings received damage. The town did a wonderful job fixing our problem. I am 99.9% .9 confident, however, when we get a heavy rain, that 0.1% sets my spider senses tingling, and I go to my front window when we have rain coming down our street, and I'm watching, and I'm praying that it never happens again. So far, it hasn't. The town has done further work up the end, and I must say, the town trucks, uh, engineering and works, when there's a proposed water, big rainfall coming, they're diligent. They come up and they're checking things, watching for things, but I do know they had erosion at the end of our street, which they addressed, and I hope that that will fix it. They've put large boulders in there, they've done all kinds of things. I think they put in a new cement you, you may know more because, <laughs> Councillor at York, because you've been on our street quite a bit also. Um, so I think that's all fixed. However, um, I still get a little worried and so my concern is the stormwater management with the proposed. When things are done higher up than my street, I've observed that water comes down a hill but it never goes back up. There has to be very, very good infrastructure to handle that. Otherwise, and, it, and it's not good for our street. It's not, I mean, if there was damage to the ball fields, there was damage to the tennis courts, to homes. My, one of my neighbors got a lot of structural damage to her home. When she's away to meetings, she texts me and she says, Bunny, what's going on in our street? Is there much water? Or I text her and I say, don't worry, our street's okay. We know it's okay, but we still feel nervous. And this Bryson development, I gotta say, I'm for it, but it makes me nervous. And these ladies have the concern, they have young families, um, and I understand their concerns as well. But mine is the stormwater. I have a brother who lives on West Main. Several years ago, they had an issue. Um, which has mostly been resolved. However, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but if engineering and works is not really diligent with that, the screens that are supposed to keep the debris out of those large pipes doesn't always get cleaned out. So my brother, when it storms, he has to go walk down and he checks that. And if it's not cleaned out, he calls. And he lets somebody know, please come and clean that out, otherwise he has had twice, he's had water come back up on that ditch um, in behind by the tennis courts, it backs up and it comes up onto their properties and gives them bad memories as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. The only other thing I would like to make a constructive comment 
and just say that the counselors who lean in and project their voices are clearly heard. But sometimes, maybe it's my ears, but it's rather hard sometimes to hear. So it's just constructive criticism. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Brian Fitzgerald. I live in Kentville and uh, been a uh, citizen of Kentville since 2005. Before that, I was in New Minas. Uh, but I've been a taxpayer in Kentville since 1992. Uh, I'm the owner of Patty's Pub. and. Uh, I've never been involved in the council's business, and uh, I'm not sure why I'm here tonight other than say it's nice to have a council and that tries to take care of the affairs of our business, our town. Uh, looking at the past, I'm not sure all the decisions that the council has made in the past have been what I consider to be uh, good decisions. Uh, in the early, I think, mid-1990s, uh, the Kentville uh, Electric Commission was sold, and there was $12 million put in the bank. And uh, at that time, there was a big plot of land downtown Kentville that was the rail lands that was vacant. And what the council should have done at the time was to take the $12 million in the vacant land down there and put a beautiful complex down there that would have served all the community as it is today. Unfortunately, those decisions weren't made that way. And now we have, in the rail lands today, a large vacant property that is way underutilized, and it should be tapped in to be housing. We also have other lands in our community that we could put in a, a complex that we've all talked about year after year after year after year, and nothing's ever been done about it. Don't do it for me. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for your grandchildren. That's who I have around here. I have grandchildren. They love swimming. They love all the sports in this community. And if you do the right things, by the way, your $12 million is half purchase about purchasing power today as it was then. And now you're trying to assemble a new community center by bringing everybody else into the complex. And now you're going to have to decide whether you can do it here or you're going to have to do it with others and put it somewhere else, which I believe is a mistake. Be that as it may, I'm going to call that the end of my story about that. But anyway, I have one other thing I'd like to talk to you about. Um, our business has been in Kentville since 1992. Uh, we started brewing beer in Kentville in 1995. We are now the oldest craft brewer, original, in the Maritimes, if not in Atlantic Canada. Um, we're well known for it. Um, there are now 70 craft brewers in Nova Scotia alone, not including what we have in Atlantic Canada. And we'd like to continue to advance our business. We're going to be in the home show uh, coming up in two weeks' time. So I hope you all plan to attend and visit our stuff, you know, because we're going to give you a free sample of our <laughs> food <laughs> and our beer. And if, you, if you're not a beer drinker, that's okay. We got something else for you. But anyway, be that as it may, 
Um, we have, by the way, look, uh, the Blue Jays are starting to play tonight, so we have to get home. So and watch that game. <laughs> and the Bruins are. But you know what I noticed in the Blue Jays? They all have beer. You know they, you know you can get beer in the Blue Jays. And I've always thought that wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a spot, our business has a spot, in our baseball park where we could serve our beer to our patrons, to our customers. And I think it would bring a lot more people into the ballpark to watch our beautiful team. So if you could give me a little support in that, I'd have much appreciated. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. Are there any other comments? All right. We don't have any uh, in-camera items, and uh, so all I need is a motion to adjourn. All right, I see many people, so we are adjourned. Thank you for a great meeting, everyone. <laughs>